good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on which part of the world you've uh, tuned in from. Uh, we've got uh, viewers from all over the world today, and we're very grateful to you for tuning in today. Uh, we do hope you find this webinar very exciting. We've already have had some of our speakers engage with you before uh, the webinar has begun, and it looks like it'll be a very stimulating meeting today. Uh, we do have a round of introductions that we'd like to do before we start today's webinar. Uh, we have three industry experts in artificial intelligence. Uh, we've got uh, three clinicians who've uh, adopted uh, artificial intelligence into their practices. Uh, and we're very grateful to all our speakers uh, for sharing their experience with us today. Uh, we know that you've got very busy schedules, so Thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy schedule today. Uh, our convener, uh, Nitesh Naik, uh, will be logging in just now. Uh, he's really the brainchild behind uh, today's uh, program. He's got an avid interest in artificial intelligence, and uh, we're really grateful that we have him with us today to share his experience. I can't really start this program without introducing Nitesh Naik. Uh, Nitesh Nayak is, uh, uh, is a professor of mechanical and uh, 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 manufacturing engineering at the Manipal Institute of Technology. He's what we would describe as an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur. He's been involved with a number of innovations that he's invented himself. He developed the ureteric stent tracker mobile called Eurostents. And more recently, he's also developed uh, an innovative endoscopic scissor called uh, uh, Rector Scissor. And we are currently trying these scissors as a cold on block excision tool for superficial bladder cancers. Uh, additionally, he's uh, in, been affiliated with a number of high profile industry experts. So in total, he's got around four to five years experience in industry and another four to five years of experience in academia as well. Uh, he's published over 45 research articles. Uh, he's uh, also uh, applied for eight national and international uh, patents for his various innovations that he's been involved with. In 2018, he was voted as the most exciting a uh, young teacher in South India by the Indian Express for his contributions to academia, uh, research and innovation. And more recently, uh, he's also been awarded the prestigious Bayrak Big Grant Award. So if I can ask uh, Dr. or Dr. or Professor Nitesh Naik perhaps to take the floor and share a few slides, please. And once he does that, I will introduce some of our other speakers as well. Dr. Milapsha, can you hear me? Sorry, Dr. Nitesh Naik, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. You can see my screen, sir? Yes, we can see you. If you can just go on the full screen, yeah, love. Good evening, all. ITRU, International Training and Research in Euro-Oncology and Endo-Urology, presents you today a webinar on artificial intelligence, transforming future of urology. The event is supported by Sun Pharmaceuticals. AI refers to simulation of human intelligence in machines that are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. The term may be applied to a mini machine that exhibits traits associated with human mind, such as learning and problem solving. Today, we will discuss with the experts the current state and future prospects of artificial intelligence in urology and healthcare in a broader perspective. On behalf of ITRU, I welcome the panel experts, Professor Naim Sumro, Dr. Renu Etirajan, Dr. Milap Shah, Mr. Manish, Mr. Mahesh Sivi, Mr. Amit Kamath, who accepted our invitation to be the faculty for the webinar to share their experience and enlighten us. I'm sure you are going to enjoy the sessions and the panel discussions. I heartily welcome our moderators for the session, Dr. Bhavan Prasad Rai, Dr. Dashrat Raj K. Shetty, 
who will be actively steering the webinar today we are grateful to the participants for overwhelming response shown with 1100 pre registrations for the webinar about itru the international training and research in neuro oncology and under urology association represents researchers in urological care globally it is a dynamic organization with focus on importance of training and research in neuro oncology and under urology for residents and consultant urologists itru aims to foster higher standards in training and research globally to facilitate the holistic development of next generation methods procedures and technology in the field of urology meet the team it's my pleasure to introduce you to the itru group spearheaded by professor baskar somani university of southampton the team comprises of dr bon prasad rai from freeman hospital newcastle tyne united kingdom dr b m zishan hamid associate professor and chief at innovation center kasturba medical college manipal dr milap shah registrar department of urology kasturba medical college manipal the team is greatly supported by dr sufyan ibrahim who is steering our social media and ms shiny executive assistant who coordinates all the proceedings you can follow us like share and comment on instagram facebook twitter linkedin and you can watch our previous webinars and subscribe to our channel at itru group i would like to introduce and it's my privilege to introduce you to my vice president and the moderator of the today's session dr bhavan rai he is a consultant urology surgeon with a specialist interest in robotic surgery minimally invasive surgery and urological oncology at freeman hospital newcastle united kingdom he is one of the few urologists worldwide to have undertaken double high volume fellowship training in robotic surgery he is the chairman of euro oncology multi disciplinary meeting at freeman hospital he is the vice president at itru he is a teaching faculty member in number of international robotic and minimal invasive courses he has published extensively on urological and surgical research and has over 100 peer reviewed articles national and international he has msc research degree evaluating the role of urinary biomarker as a diagnostic tool for bladder cancer his current research interests include research systematic reviews in neuro oncology and surgical education he has also been a sub investor for several regional and national trials i take my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague dr dashrath raj k shetty he is associate professor at manipal institute of technology manipal academy of higher education he is an author columnist educationist and social entrepreneur presently he is the secretary general of indian bureau of administrators and technocrats and director of micro saharda credit cooperative limited He has recently authored the book Learning Like a Lion. Dashrath Raj has three postgraduate degrees: MBA Finance, MPhil Management, and MTech in Computer Science and Engineering. He has received his PhD, Doctor of Philosophy in Computer Science and Engineering, from Mahid. He is also Microsoft Certified Technology Specialist, Dale Carnegie High Impact Teaching Skills Trainer. i am a certified management trainer and ramkrishna bajaj national quality award examiner i request dr bhavan to take over the proceedings thank you very much uh, nitesh uh, for that presentation uh, we now as uh, nitesh has said we've got six pre presenters today three of us are clinicians and three of us are uh, industry experts so i will introduced our clinical experts uh, who adopted who have uh, adopted artificial intelligence in their clinical practice uh, i'd like to first introduce our youngest speaker milap shah uh, milap is a senior registrar 
or resident uh, undergoing super speciality training in uh, urology as part of an MCM program uh, in the prestigious Kasturba Medical College in Manipal. He completed his undergraduate training and his postgraduate general surgical training at the Gujarat Medical College in Gujarat in India. He is an active researcher as well with interests in artificial intelligence. Obviously, that's why he's here today. Uh, and he was also part of the team that developed the app Eurostens. Currently in uh, ITRU, we are very grateful to have him because he leads our research and innovation activities. So we look forward to listening to you speak, uh, Mila. We've now, uh, I'd like to next introduce, uh, Nitesh, if I could request you to go to the next slide, please. So it, this uh, introduction gives me some great pleasure because Professor Naeem Sumra is not just a fellow colleague, but also a fellow robotic surgeon. Professor Sumro has been a consultant urologist at the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle in United Kingdom and has had over 30 years of experience in minimally invasive surgery. And during this period, he's trained a number of surgeons that uh, have gone on to achieve a lot of success within the field. He's currently the Royal College of Surgeon uh, of England lead in robotic and digital surgery. He's also the director of robotic surgery at Newcastle. And it's with great pride that we say that Newcastle is perhaps one of the widest adopters of multi-speciality robotic surgery. We've got over eight specialities that perform robotic surgery with 25 robotic surgeons within the unit. And we've probably done close to 10,000 procedures as a unit across all specialities. Uh, Professor Sumru is also the executive director of the Newcastle Surgical Training Center. Within this training center, we offer over 300 minimally invasive and robotic uh, courses on an annual basis. Additionally, Professor Sumro has been involved with a number of uh, research activities involved with artificial intelligence. And I can assure you, he's very excited about today's webinar. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Reni Etherajan. Dr. Reni Etherajan is a consultant oncopathologist with, with over 15 years of clinical experience in pathology. She is the director of pathology at Sikta Play for over three years now. Sikta Play is one of those organizations that have very uh, nicely adopted AI solutions uh, across various domains of healthcare delivery. Dr. Etirajan conducts medical validations in hematology, clinical pathology, histopathology, cytology, and microbiology uh, based solutions. And Dr. Tirajan, we're really looking forward to listening to your talk on computational pathology. I'll conclude my introductions of the clinical experts now. I'll request Dr. Shetty to introduce our industry experts, Mr. Manish Sivi, Mr. Kamath, and Mr. Suravakar. So I'll unmute, I'll mute myself here and request Dr. Shetty to take over. Thank you, Dr. Rai. Uh, let me introduce uh, Mahesh Kumar Sivi the co-founder and chief operating officer at Orbit Shifters Incorporated. He'll be talking on internet of medical things today. Um, Mr. Maish uh, has been in the analytics space for more than 18 years. He has uh, helped many organizations in defining the vision for their product monetization programs. Prior to founding Orbit Shifters, he has worked with uh, Dalmia Bharat Group, IBM, uh, Mindtree, Rolto organizations in analytics and big data space. He has been a mentor of uh, Atal Innovation Mission, Niti Aayog Initiative. Mahesh is a recipient of best CEO, uh, COO by uh, Everlex at IIT Hyderabad in, two, uh, in the year 2019. He has featured in SAP TV and featured several AI interviews in Enado Television. He has mentored, uh, he's a mentor in AIM Mentorship Circle an initiative by Analytics India magazine. Orbit Shifters has been lifted, uh, shif uh, Orbit, shifter, uh, Orbit Shifters has been shortlisted as most promising top 20 AI startups in India by CIO uh, Review India. We welcome you, sir. We are eager to listen to you. Next, Mr. Amit uh, Kamath, uh, Education Technical Evangelist, uh, MathWorks India. He will be speaking on 3D segmentation using deep learning uh, AI revolutionizing healthcare. Amit is an education uh, technical evangelist at uh, MathWorks India. He works with the academic institutions in India 
on the adoption of MathWorks uh, workflows in curriculum and research. Amit has been uh, with MathWorks for seven years and has previously worked with the engineering development group and software development in the image processing and computer vision areas, focusing on workflows for image uh, registration and pixel labeling. His areas of uh, interest include computer vision and software engineering. Amit has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from NITK Suratkal. Amit also has a master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Minnesota. Welcome Amit. Next, uh, we move on to Manish Suralkar, product manager, Securable Technologies Private Limited Bangalore. He will be talking, uh, uh, his topic would be how AI can help in providing accurate affordable and accessible healthcare. He has, uh, he handles the AI driven uh, suit of products in pathology and ophthalmology. Uh, he's responsible for product roadmap, product execution, validation, and go to market uh, initiatives. He's a certified Scrum product owner and experienced in building AI ML powered products catering to sectors like healthcare, manufacturing, retail, and workspace management. Uh, he is an uh, MBA graduate from IIT Roorkee and holds a BTEC degree in uh, metallurgical and uh, material uh, engineering. A warm welcome to all of you, dear friends. Without any further delay, I would like to hand over uh, the session to Mr. Manish Suratkal. Over to you, sir. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? And can you see my presentation? Uh, can you see my presentation? Yeah, we can see you and hear you, Manish. Yeah, uh, thanks Thanks for the introduction. So when we'll start, so I'm Manish Suralkar, uh, product manager at Sectapal. So at Sectapal, we try to provide intelligent screening solutions uh, to aid diagnosis um, uh, through AI. And uh, today the topic of discussion is uh, how EA can help in providing accurate, affordable, and accessible healthcare. So, uh, so healthcare is a very big topic. Uh, so I, that's why I wanted to concentrate where we can impact more and more towards the masses. Uh, uh, and uh, that's why primary care comes into the picture where every, all of us, uh, the, most of the population actually uh, it caters uh, that and it's kind of a first line of defense. So what primary care does, it detects disorders early. Uh, it also reduces the oral expenditure by preventing serious complications. But there are some problems uh, with respect to primary care, uh, which has been uh, detected with respect to a diagnostic test that they are not accurate. Uh, and before, because of that, a particular doctor cannot uh, accurately diagnose, diagnose uh, uh, and cannot recommend a particular medical treatment. They, they are not affordable or accessible uh, for a particular patients. And then it depends on doctor to take his own uh, uh, judgment on this and which results into uh, issues. The second uh, error is related to medical history, which is not there for particular patients. And third is with respect to the physician examination errors. Uh, which is related to uh, competency of a particular physician as well as uh, due to some communication barriers. So in healthcare and particularly in primary care, there are three uh, things which we want to concentrate to actually impact a uh, majority of people, which is accuracy, affordability, and accessibility. So when I say accuracy, it's like a delayed or incorrect diagnosis is like an inaccuracy, which has been there. When we talk about affordability, it's about the cost of the doctor uh, visit and the diagnostic test, which needs to be done for uh, uh, for for a particular uh, for diagnosing a particular type of symptom and for a disease. And uh, uh, going forward, uh, the third part is the accessibility part, where uh, if if you can see that uh, most of the most of the uh, diagnostic tests or even the uh, specialist uh, doctors are not readily available uh, or not are not very close to the patients which are in tier two, tier three or in rural areas. And this is how accuracy is impacting. So around 12 million people in US itself are uh, wrongly diagnosed uh, from outpatient itself. And uh, you can see how this problem will be multifold in developing uh, nations. 
in terms of affordability, if you talk about urinary tract infection, which impacts around 150 million uh, people uh, worldwide every year, it costs around 400 to 1000 rupees. Uh, and, and it's nine to 10 times more in developed uh, countries and some around three to five times more in few of the African nations. Talking about accessibility, uh, in India itself, we only have around uh, one lakh labs um, and that com comes out to around eight diagnostic labs per one lakh people, which is very low in terms of standards. And uh, out of one lakh labs in India, there are only thousand labs which are at NBL aggregated. So you can see how the, 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 the perform performance of the tests which are, uh, which are being done in these labs um, the accuracy is a bit questionable on that. And, uh, and that's how, even if you increase the accessibility, the accuracy will get impacted. So if you can see the topic is like triple constant triangle. And because of that, if you try to improve accuracy, the affordability and accessibility will get impacted. And same is the case if we try to improve affordability, the accuracy and accessibility uh, uh, gets impacted. And I can show you one example, uh, which is very, very much relevant in India, which is about tuberculosis. So in India, there are about 27 lakhs uh, cases of tuberculosis, out of which 25% are not even reported. So you can understand because of the affordability or accessibility uh, issues. And we talk about accuracy, the primary screening test is done as a smear test, which has around 50 to 60% of sensitivity. So you can see that 40% or about 50% of people who may be having tuberculosis are not diagnosed itself. Now, if you move to a more accurate test to diagnose this TB, uh, it may cost you around 1200 and even more. Uh, that, that was an Indian, uh, Indian rate. And uh, if you talk about accessibility of this kind of test, and even if you reduce the cost of this test, uh, it requires a microbiologist, which is again, uh, uh, which is low in numbers plus it requires a capital cost, plus a PCR machine, uh, which costs you around 16 to 18 lakhs. So again, if there's no volume, uh, the, the labs or the doctors, they're not able to afford it. And that's why the access, uh, those kind of instruments will be only in tier one uh, seat is that to very bad. Okay, so going forward, uh, so we have concluded about the problems. Now let's talk about AI technologies, which are helpful in uh, healthcare. So one is natural language processing. It's uh, pretty simple. We have every day, we are using it in our home automations or even in chatbots. So uh, if you see, uh, if there's a, there's a consumer complaint, uh, a bot actually replies to your com uh, complaint and that is nothing but a natural language processing uh, technology. The second part is the predictions based on machine learning. So in this case, if you've seen stock price forecasting of the weather, or maybe, uh, or, or maybe diagnosing something with respect to data, it comes under this kind of AI technology. And the third and very important uh, technology is image recognition. And uh, without this technology, a uh, driverless car, which we kind of hear a lot more these days, would not be possible itself. So moving to how AI has evolved. Uh, so earlier, it was more of a rule-based uh, system so um, just taking an example of a Fitbit that it takes your height, weight, and uh, the amount of movement you're doing, and it gives you a calorie. So there's a rule uh, involved in uh, that. And uh, going towards a more complex AI part of it, it's a classic machine learning thing. So it's like an input is given, like this is a car or not. And a data scientist, what he does, he kind of codes this that if there are four wheels, there, there is one steering. Uh, if there's a one windshield, then that should be a call car. And this is how an algorithm learns. And it classifies that if it has a four wheels, if, a, if it has a windshield and one steering, it will be called a car. But how it has uh, evolved with deep learning is that the same feature extraction in it, uh, which has been done by data scientists, it has been automated and it has been done by the machine itself. So what it has does that a data scientist may not may miss out few of the features which are not uh, been captured. And because of that, the accuracy of the machine learning algorithm, that it's a car or not a car can go on a toss. But with deep learning as the machine itself is extracting those features that uh, with, with, with very minute kind of features as well, the accuracy has gone up for particularly for the uh, 
uh, algorithms for 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 video video based or for image based uh, with respect to deep learning and as well as the capability of ai has in, uh, evolved and uh, uh, with deep learning uh, needless to say the complexity has also evolved uh, with this kind of uh, capabilities now we'll move towards that what kind of us uh, ai use cases are there in market itself uh, so um, and i'm jotting down them with respect to their capabilities which are there and how accurate affordable and accessible are they so let's talk about uh, self care prevention wellness uh, segment where we have elip core uh, it's it's a personal ecg activity it actually uh, tracks uh, tracks the numbers of ecg and updates uh, updates physician it also triggers uh, a real uh, real issues to the physician and cuts down the uh, noise so basically it works on rule based system which is rbs and machine learning uh, 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 technology uh, definitely it is accurate and accessible uh, because as a device which has been provided to consumer but when we talk about affordability the device itself cost you around 15 to 20000 so uh, not not a thing which a masses masses can use the second part is the triaging and diagnosis which is generally done by the primary care but the time kind of solutions if you see here are symptoms checkers so they are like uh, a patient uh, inputs his symptoms and through nlp natural language processing those inputs are being classified and this data is based fit uh, is actually uh, given to machine learning algorithm and then machine learning al algorithm actually detects that what kind of a diagnostic test it needs to be done what kind of medical treatment and it kind of recommends uh, to the uh, primary care provider this is a very good relief uh, for the primary care providers and as you talk about accuracy uh, it it kind of uh, reduces the misdiagnosis but if you see the input is very different like uh, every person is different in terms of their language and that's why the accuracy still needs improvement uh, in most of the uh, solutions which are there affordability it's still there is uh, that 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 there is a chance of improvement which needs to be uh, done there but when we call up accessibility as it is on mobile app it's very much accessible so a person um, staying at his home can actually log in and it can he can did, uh, and he can get a treatment uh, the third part of it is the diagnostics part where there is a lab test which are done so particularly uh, pathology ophthalmology and radiology most of the tests are depend on image recognitions and and the most of the inputs are uh, been given by the doctor are are manual by looking at the images so in this case deep learning and machine learning uh, technology of ai has been proven very good very good and uh, uh, solutions like site diagnostics uh, point, uh, which provides you point of care blood testing it's using images to actually do blood counting which is not uh, where while use uh, not using a flow cytometry which is being used in uh, 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 an everyday laboratory and same is case with the idx which use retinal images uh now the accuracy point of view these are very much accurate because uh, the images which are been given are given by a device and the input is pretty much standardized and it has been tested and fda approved most of the uh, solutions but when we call of affordability uh, it's still poor because the devices which are used to take the images are still there so the capital cost is still there from accessibility point of view uh, there are few things uh, which needs improvement but still it's there's a long way to go uh, for ai to help them then so what we are trying to tell here is that ai will is not a silver bullet it will not it will not kind of uh, converge this intersect with accuracy and affordability and accessibility everything will come quick together but what it will do it will actually reduce the constraints that now the solutions will be more accurate more affordable and more accessible but what what is next maybe in 5 years down the line it can it can be possible but from our my opinion it will be only be possible uh, uh through few, few few more changes but why it is not possible currently it's because currently ai is not able to replace the expert and it is still a kind of thing. there's a capital cost still involved as i told you and accuracy is only with respect to standardized so 
AI can bring all this together, accuracy, academic accessibility. But there is a need for other cutting and technology also to combine here. So as we are talking about robotics, it needs to, uh, there should be innovation in that where it can provide you an accurate results with, with a more affordable uh, uh, ro robotics, uh, robotics components. Uh, we need uh, edge computing and 5G networks so that uh, the solution is provided to masses and it is more accessible. And we need uh, in, uh, inputs from biochemistry, domain and microfetics so that uh, they, can re they can reinvent a will and think in more of a non-conventional directions. So the, the, the point here is that it is still, it is possible, but AI definitely needs help from all these eight uh, cutting edge uh, technologies. So that's it from my side. Uh, uh, thank, you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Manish. That was an excellent talk. It's always a challenge uh, balancing affordability and technological evolution. Uh, uh, evolution. So uh, we will have further discussions about that in the Q&A section. Uh, I'd like to now uh, uh, ask uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Milap Shah. He'll be speaking on what we as urologists need to know about artificial intelligence. Again, thank you very much, Manish, for your talk. It was excellent. Thank you. And Mela, if I can ask you to share your screen and take the floor over, please. Thank you, Mela. That is my screen visible now? Yes, your screen is visible and we can hear you quite clearly. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction at the beginning. Uh, diving straight into the presentation, a brief disclaimer. My presentation basically is targeted to all my fellow urology colleagues and young urologists who have developed a keen interest in AI and are in the initial stages, but still are unable to understand the terminologies. And the examples that I'll be using are just for depiction and the value should not be taken literally. So in my initial months, when I started researching about AI and its applications in neurology, what I found was that I could not understand the terminology per se, did not know how the algorithms function and did not know how they chose an algorithm. So I ended up reading only the objectives and the conclusions of the entire article. So basically the solution for us urologists uh, who are more involved in research is just understand the concepts, let the coding and everything be left to the experts. So I'll basically try and explain you all the terminologies here and try to make you understand the concepts behind it. So starting with the very basics, there is no clear definition of artificial intelligence. There are cool definitions like it is a replica of human intelligence, cool things that computer can't do, but there is no scientific means to it. We should know the difference between its subsets, that is machine learning and deep learning, and the two most important characteristics attributed to AI, that is adaptability and autonomy. By adaptability, I mean that even without our supervision, the machine should be able to perform and give good output results. And by autonomy, I mean that as and when more and more data is fed to it, the results improve. So basic analogy I came up with for better understanding for my fellow urology people. Uh, artificial intelligence is basically a discipline which can be compared to MS general surgery, machine learning to our super speciality course, and deep learning to the subspeciality which might we follow after the MCH courses. And data science per se is more like an umbrella term. So data scientists are basically an all-in-one category man who is dealing with, who is a mathematician, might be a computer engineer, a statistician, and he deals with everything. So AI is basically programming systems to perform tasks which require human intelligence. Machine learning is basically a urology resident. The more he learns, the better he gets. He learns from the experience and more and more the data is, the better the machine gets. And deep learning can be directly compared to our human brain. The input passes from a neuron to the next neuron and finally the output get, we get the output. Same goes with deep learning, but instead of neurons, there are layers here. So what are the sub areas of machine learning which we actually use in the various applications of uh, urology? So basically it depends on the types of the problems we are tackling and what type of data we are dealing with. It might be supervised learning, unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning. By what type of data I mean, it might be of two types. It might be a labeled data and an unlabeled data. Labeled data is nothing but when you give an input which already has been categorized. For in this example, say the images have already been categorized into staghorn calculus and a pelvic calculus. Or a numerical value has been assigned to it. That is like the density of the stones. But in unlabeled data, there is no particular tag given to it. They are not categorized. So a type of stone and a composition of stone can be called a labeled data. The density, the number of stones can be called a labeled data. 
So supervised learning basically deals with this kind of label data. It has three basic steps. It recollects that what images and the input of the label data was given to it, frames a model into it. For example, in this case, it will formulate a plan that the staghorn calculus uh, looks like a bigger stone, which involves all the calices. And the pelvic stone is much more smaller and does not involve all the calyces. So when next, when we put an image of a staghorn head calculus and ask the model to identify it, it gives, predicts that this is a staghorn calculus because it involves all the calyces and is much larger in size. There are two different models. There is the regression models and the classification models. The regression models for the easier understanding, I found that it basically predicts a number. It deals with numericals. And classification models basically de uh, deals with the states, that is the type of the stone, the composition of the stone. For example, in this case, we have already categorized them into a staghorn and a pelvic calculus. What is unsupervised learning? Unsupervised learning basically uh, deals with unlabeled data. There is no tag attached to the data that we give it as an input. So here we have six images, three are of staghorn, three are of renal pelvic calculus, but the machine does not know that they are staghorn or renal pelvic calculus. What they basically do is just categorize them and form groups. So all the images having similar features are grouped into one. So if you see the top three images are of staghorn, the bottom three are of renal pelvic calculus. So basically the machine will tell, help us that the top three images are different from the bottom ones. They won't categorize them into staghorn and pelvic calculus. This is known as clustering. So clustering is one of the branches of unsupervised learning. This is the simple task of splitting the data set into similar groups. That is basically we are decreasing the number of rows here. If you see the input data had three rows and the output has only two rows. So basically we are decreasing the number of rows here, rows here that is clustering. Now same thing if we try and decrease the number of columns, it is known as dimensionality reduction. A basic example for uh, would be like if you are planning to predict the stone free rate in a PCNL procedure for a patient, then we'll be considering various features like uh, the patient features, the stone features, the surgeon experience, patient comorbidities, and the sheath size and the nephroscope size. So here basically we have seven, uh, seven columns and seven features. So now if you can see the top two, size and volume can be condensed into one. The bottom two sheath and the nephroscope size can be condensed into one. So basically what we are doing here is reducing the number of columns. We have reduced it from seven to five. Now, if you want to reduce both the number of rows as well as number of columns, then you use the matrix factorization. Netflix is the best example for it. Imagine a large table where each row is a user, each column is a movie, and each entry in the matrix is a rating that the user gave the movie. Now with matrix factorization, one can extract certain features such as type of the movie, actors appearing in the movie and others, and be able to predict the rating that the user gives the movie based on these features. Feature selection. When we are going through various articles uh, of applications of AI in prediction of the outcomes of a PCNL or a shock wave lithotripsy, what we see, they use a particular feature. The best example is this article. If you see the second column consists of a large number of features and the, they are used to predict the stone free status, the requirement for re-PCNL, stenting insertion and blood transfusion. If you see not all features are used for predicting everything. Eventually they have ended up using only certain features. This is known as feature selection. The term that we basically come across in neurology articles is a sequential forward selection. That is adding or removing predictor variables and evaluating the effect of each change on the performance of the model. So those features only which have an impact on the outcome, which help us in predicting, only those features will be taken into consideration. The rest will be abandoned. So it helps us to save storage and computation time and makes our results also easier to understand. Another classification is the classification of observations into non-overlapping groups. A basic example would be our risk stratification models in CA prostate. Now if you apply discriminant analysis to a group, it first classifies it into low-risk low group and non-low-risk group. Then you again apply it to the non-low-risk group people, and then it particularly classifies it into intermediate risk or high risk. So we end up having three different groups based on our observations, which are non-overlapping. This is discriminant analysis. There are two types, basically linear and quadratic, and I won't go into details of that as of now. The third aspect is the reinforcement learning. The best example would be a self-driving car and uh, our uh, AI games, the chess game. Basically here, the agent is not told what to do. If you remember MBBS days, there was positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. That was the reward and the punishment. Based on that, this is developed. The agent makes a move, and if he makes the correct move, he's rewarded. And he understands that he has to make similar moves to reach the goal. 
if he makes a wrong move he is punished and he avoids those moves in the future the basic and the main objective is to get as many rewards as possible and reach the goal there are different object uh, algorithms classifications regression algorithms classification is basically for categories and regression is for numbers for our simple understanding uh not in any particular order we'll start with the most simplest one the nearest neighbor classifier it is one of the simplest classifiers if you see there are a training set the green ones and the blue ones and now we have put a test set that is the two stars have been put into the image now what the nearest neighbor classifier does is checks uh, to which of the two data sets it is closest to in terms of features or the geometric distance if you consider in terms of geometric distance it is known as the euclidean distance and if you consider in terms of features it is uh, if you see it has been classified as the green, uh, green group on the right hand side of the figure so it had the most common features with the green cluster group so it has been classified as the green group if you see in terms of urology if i give you an example let us see this uh, table me and my two colleagues ravi and sitaram prescribed three drugs so and dr x then prescribed other three drugs now if you see how k nearest neighbor will be predicting the user behavior and what drug it should recommend uh, dr x as to be prescribed next if you see it in the first three columns the similarity score of dr x is similar to mine he has prescribed pcm and levofloxacin so as uh, i have prescribed them so the similarity index is 2 now if you see the last column the last prescribed drug by me was rantax so the next predict uh, the next recommendation that dr x will get from the computer will be rantax because since its similarity score was similar to mine maximum close to mine the recommendation to dr x by the computer will be that which i prescribe if i had prescribed pantoprazole then the next recommendation to dr x would have been a pantoprazole group so basically it predicts user behavior and provides recommendations fuzzy c fuzzy c means is basically similar to knn but uh, there are times when data can belong to more than one cluster right for example in this case we are predicting which genes are responsible for bladder cancer for example then a particular gene might have more than one function so they belong to more than one group so in this case ap uh, application of fuzzy cms algorithm is much more useful support vector machines support vector machines are easy simple and accurate what it does is basically it maps each data item into n dimensional feature space where n is the number of features and if you see it separates it by a line which is known as the hyperplane basically it separates it in a way as the two classes maximizes the ma marginal distance and minimizes the classification errors new base classifier the new base classifier is purely probabilistic the three terms you need to know is prior odds likelihood ratio and posterior odds let us take an example of ca prostate for example let's say the prevalence of ca prostate is 5 out of 100 that is 5% now if a uh, screening test of psa is used with uh, sensitivity of 80 and 90 specificity of 90% then the true positives will be 80 by 100 false positives will be 10 by 100 now since 5 out of the 100 men have prostate cancer there is a, on an average 5 men with prostate cancer for every 95 men which are normal so the prior odds here will be 5 is to 95 now the likelihood ratio is nothing but true positives divided by false positives here it will be 8 and so the posterior odds will be 8 into the likelihood ratio into the prior odds ratio that is the 40 is to 95 so the actual probability of the patient having a positive psa test would be just 30% now let us say if your friend is coming to you he says that my psa test is positive then what is my probability of getting actual uh, be being positive for prostate cancer now for total 100 patients uh, prevalence is 5 out of 100 sensitivity is 80% so true positive is 4 specificity is 90% so false positivity is 9 out of 100 so the actual probability of him having ca prostate in spite of a positive psa test which has very high sensitivity and specificity is actually only 30%. The decision tree is nothing but our management approach flow charts. If you see this is a kind of a reverse tree. The basic root problem is known as the root, the end of the tree is known as the leaf and the in between branches are known as nodes. So basically it appears like our management approach in all the cases which we see in the textbooks. Now when multiple trees get together they form a forest, simple. So random forest is nothing but an amalgamation of all the different decision trees. it can reduce the variance resulted from the concentration of a single decision tree for the same data set regression as i said earlier classification or the classifiers are basically for categories regression deals with numbers linear regression is more like uh, nearest neighbor but output is in numericals and logistic regression its cousin is gives a measure of uncertainty of the prediction now let us say i have a data of 100 patients with stone size 
and whether they have passed the stones spontaneously or not after the medical therapy. If I plot it on a graph, if you see on the top of the line, I have plotted uh, the patients who have passed the stone. At the bottom, there are patients who have not passed the stone. X-axis is the size of the stone and Y-axis is the possibility of them passing the stone after medical therapy. Now, if you draw a linear line, you actually get the certainty of how much uh, is the rate or the percentage whether the patient will be able to pass the stone. So I, if the, I want to uh, judge whether a patient having a size of stone 6 to 8 mm, what is his probability of passing the stone? Then if you draw a linear line here, it comes to around 70%. So the probability of the patient having 6 to 8 mm stone size of passing the stone spontaneously is around 70% or not passing a stone is 30%. Deep learning and neural networks is basically beyond my scope to explain. Yeah, I will leave it to the experts, but basically it uh, works on the human brain model. It basically, just like in humans, the information is passed from one neuron to the another, to the next, and eventually it gives an output. Here there are different layers, an input layer, the hidden layers, and the output. It is useful when the data is available incrementally and when you wish to constantly update the model and where you could be expect un uh, unexpected changes in your data. So, for example, if you have a stone in the upper calyx in an image, would be detected only if the training data included an image in the stone in the upper calyx, right? But now convolutional neural networks can recognize the stone anywhere in the image, even if it is in the lower calyx that is unexpected for the training module, uh, the algorithm, then also it will uh, recognize the stone and give an output that the stone is in the lower calyx, in spite of it being trained only on upper calyxial stone images. Now, these were the terms that used to come in uh, across during the materials and the methods when you read an article. Now, what you come across in the uh, results part would be terms like accuracy. So accuracy is basically the number of correct predictions of the positive samples divided by the total number of predictions or samples. Next you come across is precision. So precision is out of all the positive samples which were actually correct. That is the precision of the model. And recall is out of the positive samples what percentage was the actually noted by your model. That is the recall. Area under the curve is basically the quantification of the ROC curves. If the AUC is one, it is a perfect classifier but not possible in the real world as of now. If AUC is between 0 0.6 to 0 0.9, it can be considered to be a good performance. And if it is less than or equal to five, it is termed as a random classifier with not a good performance as all. So I would not be wrong if I stress the fact that not only the quantity matters, but the quality of the data that goes into the machine matters a lot as well. So training data needs to contain enough information that is relevant to the problem at hand. Coming to the fag end of my presentation, how to decide which algorithm to use. There is no best method or one size fits all. We should leave it to the experts. It is just plainly trial and error, but algorithm selection depends on the size and the type of the data you are working with, the insights you want to get from the data and how those insights will be used. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you very much, Melab. Uh, I think that was an excellent talk and I really loved some of the analogies that you used. I think for someone so young uh, to know so much about artificial intelligence, particularly considering that you're a uh, urologist by background is absolutely fantastic. I'm sure there'll be a number of questions in the Q&A sections, uh, and we'll, we'll certainly come to you at that stage. Uh, mm -hmm. The next talk is on the role of artificial intelligence in research uh, and surgical training. Professor Naeem Sunro will be delivering this talk, so I will let him share his screen now. Right. Um, thank you, uh, Bhavan. Uh, um, I, uh, 30 years ago, when I started training, the worst thing I used to do was holding my consultant's retractor for three hours, because we didn't have uh, self-retaining retractors uh, as an assistant, and we were doing open operations, pelvic operation. I couldn't see anything. Uh, so maybe that was a reason I said we must do something better and I become a consultant. So I uh, took over and moved away from that open surgery and just being trained by standing beside a senior surgeon uh, to move towards conventional laparoscopy that was in the late 90s. And that is where concept of uh, training in a, in, a, in a lab setting or with cadavers and with, with uh, pigs and with uh, inanimate objects started. And then we moved to the mechanical phase or industrial phase of robotics about 10 years ago. 
you know, in a wider fashion in the UK. And I was saying that now I would hope that we are moving towards a digital era, that we are robot and all the intervention we do as surgeons are captured as a data and analyzed and part of the wider paradigm uh, to develop a digital surgical journey. So my uh, role, I'm currently uh, RCS lead in robotic and digital surgery. The Royal College Surgeon of England is very much focused on how surgery would be developed and surgery will be trained for the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, in addition to my other roles, I'm, I'm speaking that capacity and what my understanding is. I, I really enjoyed Milan's uh, previous talk. I think it was very, very impressive. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, it is not commonly known that surgery is a primary treatment for 50% of patients with cancer and accounts for one third of all the hospital division in UK. That is about 5 million uh, procedures uh, each or admissions each year. And uh, surgery accounts for uh, treatment of cancer in 45% of patients and 27% uh, and 29% is chemo and radiotherapy. So it is the major uh, mode of treatment for cancer. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to. Uh, but uh, despite uh, all this, only 3.5% of research funding in UK is focused on surgical care. And it has an impact. We have known since 90s that uh, minimally invasive surgery is better for patients with cancer or patients having surgery in abdomen or thorax. But if you look at the lower part of the uh, this graph in surgery is still in UK between 40 to 50 percent patients who got lung cancer, rectal cancer, colon cancer, or uterine cancer still have their operation by open uh, way as I used to do or I used to assist 30 years ago. So we haven't changed much. We have known that for 30 years. But you look at the upper uh, part of this slide, the urology uh, prostatectomy, 91 percent of uh, uh, Surgery now is done using minimalistic routes uh, in, in partial infectomy. We are close to uh, 60 or 70 percent, uh, and also cystectomy as well. I was very impressed, although we started doing robotics, we used to go to America to learn, but now our adoption of robotics and middle is much more than it is in USA. So I, I was very proud of that, that slide from, from that point of view. So I think, I think we have done quite a lot, but my role over here is not a urology, but as a surgeon to say how other surgical specialties go through that route. And I think it's only by adoption of robotics that we can actually have adoption of MIS uh, close to 95%. And Royal College of Surgeon actually uh, commissioned uh, a, a commission on future of surgery. Uh, uh, and it came up with four recommendations and we suggested the future would be robotics. It will be big data. Uh, it would have mixed reality to train surgeon and advanced materials. And based on that, uh, uh, we started this RCS Robotic and Digital Surgery Initiative. I'm one of the leads along with Simon Back, and we have three other people, and we are focusing on four different areas. We, we think any intervention or any research, any adoption be based on very robust research, and we have got a research group of all the surgical specialities. We are working with Health Education England, whose role is to deliver surgical trainings to develop future models of training and future ways of training in robotics and digital surgery. We are working with all the industry partners so they know where to come in, whether they are digital companies, mixed platform companies, artificial intelligence companies, and also robotic companies that they can work with us in, in adoption of uh, the, their systems and also uh, in, in uh, research and, and evaluation of the systems. We are also working with the NHS and the government, Department of Health, NICE, and specialized commissioning to influence uh, the national stakeholders to align their policy, which goes towards wider adoption of uh, robotic and digital surgery. So that's the role that we are doing. So AI for surgery, I see uh, within, within these three areas, and they encompass everything. Artificial intelligence, as, as was mentioned, is machine learning algorithm to predict uh, using labeled and unlabeled data through reinforced learning and to adjust outputs and perform human-like tasks. This is exactly what was being mentioned before. But beyond that, when we come to surgery, we go towards augmented intelligence in which the outputs that complement human intelligence along with mix, mix and virtual reality in surgical training and in clinical delivery and use of automated performance matrix and data which is uh, created while we are performing surgery. And also in addition to that, ambient intelligence in application of severe technologies 
uh, including sensors. So we adopt sensors, now we use this Apple Watch or Fitbit or whatever. We can use that in post-operative care or peer habilitation in patients so, so they have best outcomes. So I think in surgical care, I think we need all of those uh, things. So what we are doing in uh, uh, Royal College is we are undertaking a mastery trial, which basically is that we are selected eight centers in the UK, which are multi-specialty robotic programs. And we are focusing on six surgical specialities and a procedure in each specialty, like in urology, it is prostate cancer, in lung is lung section, hysterectomy and, and rectal section and so on and so forth. So we are going to capture uh, robotic video data and also uh, data from, from the IDRs as well. So there's a uh, digital data. We'll annotate uh, the clinical context, i.e. video will be labeled and we'll then ask intuitive surgical to capture that data and do advanced metrics. And then the data will be sent to us and we will involve different UK universities and institutions and see whether we can see patterns, we can classify or we can predict outcomes. And that's basically uh, a, a multi-center study that is starting from October. Newcastle is the lead center. I'm a chief investigator for that trial along with Simon Back. So I think that's a major advancement. So I'll, this is what we are trying to do. If you see a uh, robot is suturing, but if you see uh, down over here, the data is being produced from the right hand and the left hand. So basically it's, it's like we are trying to write music now. And once you have written the music, everybody can play the music. So I think uh, in future, you look at this data and you, so I'll just, I'll just run it through so you can see uh, how the data would be captured. And this is uh, real time data of suturing. Uh, So this is, this is based on uh, picking up about 96 different uh, gestures a surgeon makes, the way it holds the instruments, the, the pressure it holds, uh, and the way camera moves it and the energy used. So, um, so, and this is a publication from Hunger Tal. C can you use that data? Is, there, is that data of value? And they are published, if you look at that, that you can actually differentiate between uh, we were quite looking at regression analysis. You can differentiate between a competent surgeon and a novice. Uh, and you can also look at different movements and you can look at uh, a senior surgeon uh, whose movement would be much wider whether they are, and the fellows and the resident movements would be much lower. So whether there is roll, pitch and yaw, you can actually differentiate between that. And if you look at the right hand lower corner, you can actually in low linear regression model, you can differentiate between competent surgeons and uh, surgeons who are in training. So this can become a digital benchmarking with that, whether you are trying to predict outcomes and also when you're trying to uh, do training as well. So far, surgery has been very analog. As I said, you start an operation, your system is holding the retractor for three hours and at the end, the surgeon writes three sentences, operation went well. Nobody knows what happened actually. It's, it's a word of that surgeon or three lines written. So I think in future, we can actually capture the whole digital journey and say how exactly it happened and then train surgeons uh, in, in the future. So I think what I see in surgery is not only the operation, but it's in pre-op planning as well. And I think in pre-op planning as was being mentioned that we can actually use different uh, algorithm, but we are basically trying to look at classification, detection, segmentation and registration. We are looking at all the population data which will tell us this particular patient, what he or she needs. Uh, in terms of intraoperative guidance, we look at 3D instantiation, uh, endoscopic navigation, tissue feature tracking, and augmented reality. And in particularly in robotics, if we go towards automation, we have to look at perception, uh, localization map mapping, uh, system modulation, and human-robot interaction. I think these are the things, but that is more towards uh, automation. And this is uh, this article from Dr. Yong uh, from Imperial College, and he showed what five uh, stages of automation. Currently we are, we are, I think, in stage zero. I think by using more algorithm, I think we'll move towards maybe stage uh, two to three. I think full automation maybe 50 to 100 years uh, from now, but at least we can move from stage zero to other stage, but we can only do that if we start using algorithms uh, uh, along with the mechanical device that we have. So that's about uh, 
so outcomes and everything. So what about what about training? Uh, the next thing was um, if you look at uh, uh, curricula within within UK, and if you look at the left side, so we have got eleven surgical specialities, and these are the logbook cases which are required by the surgeon or trainee to become competent. And these are the indicative operation, and these are PBAs. So if you see in some specialities, surgeons only need 250 operations. In other plastic, they need 2,100 operations. So there's 35 fold variation between what is the competency looks like in diff different specialities. And so there is no reason why, why that may be the case. So it is just a number which has been plucked out and say, you must do X number of cases to become competent. And you can see this is exactly JCST uh, uh, slide, which shows uh, how much competency you need. So that is where we are now. Uh, and indicative operations also, it could be four, it could be five, uh, and PBAs as well. So when, when you look at indicative operation, there's 11 fold variation among the surgical specialities, what you need to know or need to do to be competent or safe surgeons. And in terms of PBAs, uh, it's eight fold variation among surgical special you'll already sit somewhere over there 915 cases or logbook cases you must do and 18 operations so you can see there is no again it's an analog procedure there is no reason why why this data is there so how we can train surgeons in the future i'll show you this uh, this is a video which i took from uh, case western university can you use uh, uh, augmented reality and this is for uh, for medical school training and some of you may have seen but i like it so much i thought i'll play it for you that how can I can use HoloLens to understand anatomy. I used to work in anatomy department and we used to dissection for hundreds of hours, but now you can do all of those things in a minute. So you can actually actually differentiate between muscles, anatomy, you look at the uh, whole skeleton uh, in real life, or if you want to look at a particular bone and you can say, I want to look at the femur and you say, I want to look at different kinds of fracture that femur would show and actually it starts showing. Um, um, and then if you say, actually, I want to look at the cardiovascular system and you can say and say, well, I'm interested in heart, how it looks like, uh, and it'll uh, show the heart. Uh, and you say, I want to see whether how it works. So you can zoom the heart and the heart will come in front of you. And say, I want to look at uh, the valves. And um, so you can start looking at the valves. So you, you can see this is what is being done now. And while you're doing all of those things, you are capturing data, how this person is understanding and actually that can be used uh, in assessing competencies. So you can do that. And this is in medical school training, which is happening in uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic and Case Western uh, uh, in the USA, but it's being used uh, in our university as well. So I'm just trying to say if I can go um, to the next slide. Right, and, but if you look at, uh, is, is it happening in, 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 in clinical practice? Yes, I think there are companies like Proxime and Touch Surgery who are using HoloLens. You can actually use that uh, in, 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 in real life, in theater environment and use HoloLens and it tells you where the cancer might be or where there's anatomy is and you can superimpose upon the patients and we are using in plastic surgery, in facial surgery. So in terms of training, what will happen is that moving from patient, this is where, where we used to start surgical training we will go move towards on the left side, we'll start using virtual and augmented reality, which will be autonomous. You can work at home and in your own time and understand the steps of the procedure and do some steps yourself virtually as well. Then you will move towards simulation, then you can work on simulators, which will have APMs attached to them you, that you we are capturing your performance matrix in simulation state. And then the third would be structure training will be based on patient, but I think you, I, I believe, but we have to test that hypothesis that you'll be able to shorten the training and you'll train surgeon much more uh, precisely. And this is one company, a 3D system in which you do simulation. It's a simulation, but it, it is also has got automated performance matrix. So everything time you do, you move your instruments that is being captured and it can be analyzed against a senior surgeon or trained surgeon and see whether your data shows that you're moving towards that or not. So you're moving away from the number games to see what competencies, real-time competencies you have. So uh, how future ecosystem would look like, and that's what we're trying to do in Northeast is that um, uh, what we have, as, as uh, Bhavan said, that we have the uh, biggest uh, robotic surgery program, we have got three Da Vinci and one macro system, and we are 
getting a meso spinal surgery as well. We now have nine surgical specialities undertaking robotic surgery. That is more than any other center. We also have a major cancer center for upper GI, HPV, cardiac, urology, colorectal surgery. We also have got an institute of transplantation. So we do all kinds of transplantation uh, in one, in one uh, hospital. And we, as uh, uh, Bhavan said, that we have got NSTC, New Surg uh, Newcastle Surgical Training Center, which we undertake robotic and digital training in 300 courses each year. But we are moving towards now developing futuristic Newcastle Digital Surgical Hub, in which we'll incorporate all those kinds of things which I've suggested, not only robotics, but also use AI and uh, augmented reality. But that, so that's what we have. So where we want to move towards is that we want to capture the whole population data for any surgical patient, that is primary care, social care data, their EHR, comorbidity, all the omics data, their digital and pathology and radiology screening, surveillance data, radiotherapy data, and uh, NC pod, which is uh, emergency care data, PROMS, PREMS, registry. So by doing that, we want to develop individualized surgical journey for each patient. So basically, that is how I think the future would look like that when the patient is coming for surgery, we would have captured all his or her data, whether he or she has frailty, whether they have with diabetes, uncontrolled, whether they are at a risk of developing clots or arrhythmias or sepsis or whatever. And we have that data and we can marry up that data with the data we are getting now from robots, then predict how the rehabilitation of that particular patient should be, i.e. We, we need to have arrhythmia signs, we should need to put sensors over there into the mobility, whether it clots or not. So to me, this is the future that will look like. So we have starting early phase of that, but I think the future is going to be all digital in my opinion. So I'll stop over here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sumro. That was a fascinating talk on perhaps even the current of uh, surgical training rather than the future. So the future obviously looks very exciting and perhaps a lot more precise as well. Uh, I'd like to now uh, request uh, Dr. Ethi Rajan, to, uh, who will be speaking to us on computation and pathology. Uh, and I think this is quite an interesting talk because this is on the diagnostic aspect of healthcare delivery. Again, something uh, with increasing uh, uh, incidence and prevalence of diseases, our diagnostic services are under a lot of pressure. And we'd be very grateful to listen to Dr. Ethi Rajan's views on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for having me over here to today evening to do this presentation on computational pathology. Uh, so this is my topic and how would computational pathology provide the pathologist a helping hand? Uh, before I actually go into what is computer, computational pathology, we all know that the recent growth in the electronic health data and the massive amount of uh, information that we're getting from the lab information system, coupled with newer, unique, powerful uh, computational approaches, has actually given birth to, and established this new and wonderful discipline, which is called as computational pathology. I'm sorry. Uh, now let's see what this new discipline of computational pathology is all about. What does it actually leverage? So it includes the information systems architecture. It also includes the approaches to data management and engineering. It also deals with algorithms and mathematical approaches from machine learning or deep learning. And finally, biomedical informatics. And what is the goal that we are trying to look at, you know, when we are trying to, you know, put all, incorporate all these features into this new discipline, the goal is to focus on unique computational challenges and present it in a clinically acknowledgeable form to a clinician or a lab personnel through integrated reports or interfaces, which will enable health stakeholders to, healthcare and stakeholders to a you know, kind of come to an appropriate medical decision, an accurate medical decision. And that's what computational pathology will actually help us in achieving. So uh, when we talk about the, uh, 
the methodology on how we have actually have to arrive, I'll give you a certain simple example, like what we would do in a lab. For example, we get a case in a lab and it could be a blood smear, a blood sample, for instance. We make a smear out of it. We try to read that smear. We try to interpret that smear and try to give a report. But that's not the end of it all. You need a lot of other information. For example, you need clinical data. You need some kind of a radiological or imaging data, which could be associated with that particular case. We also want to know previous history, which is there in that patient, and then collate and collaborate all of that put together and then arrive at a diagnosis. So generally, when you're talking about just basic AI and pathology, for example, if you take this particular peripheral blood smear, it is put into an AI enabled device or a scanner, which can scan this particular slide and give you some kind of an information. So that could be, for example, this patient had anemia. So it gives you information on the morphology of the various cell types, like RBCs, WBCs, platelets, etc. And it also kind of gives you a diagnosis. For instance, this patient had a hemolytic blood picture. Now, is that really enough for a clinician that we give out this report? We need other kinds of data as well. For example, clinically, we knew that this was a child which was basically anemic. It had pallor, it had hepatosplenomegaly, it was some kind of frontal bossing. So this is kind of another data which we need to couple and add on to this information. In addition to that, we may have an imaging data. For example, there was a hair on, uh, you know, hair on end, you know, appearance on the skull. And that's the kind of data you got from the radiological finding. So with all these insights, along with the AI report, which could be generated on this particular blood smear, what computational pathology will further do is incorporate all of this put together and arrive at a certain conclusion. And that conclusion could be that probably this patient could be a patient who is thalassemic. And, you know, there are further tests that probably could be required for this patient. For example, like you might want to do an electrophoresis, and that could be a recommendation which computational pathology can actually give out. And that is a collaborative report which can actually go on to a clinician or a treating doctor. And that is what enables, you know, a clinician to take an appropriate decision based on this collaborative report given by a computational pathology and not just a piecemeal report given on a PS slide. And this is so important when you look at any field and any department in a hospital. It, it's, it's like various departments need to collate data and arrive at a conclusive information. And this is what we generally do in our tumor board meetings and other meetings that we have like our you know clinical path meetings etc where you want to put two and two together or a lot of data and this is something you know which you are doing manually today you're trying to reach out to a clinician you're trying to reach out to a radiologist get the report and then combine all of that and try to arrive at some kind of a conclusion or a diagnosis but what if you had an ai based computational pathology process which could enable this with ease what are the things that you could achieve? You could actually bring down the turnaround time by which you know you, you give a report, which is much more earlier, a collaborative report, which gives a clinician ample enough time you know, to start a, a medical decision or a treatment much earlier than what he could have. And it could be more accurate, it would be more standardized, it is more reproducible. And of course, it's more scalable. The number of cases that can be handled in a day is definitely more scalable. So these are some of the advantages that computational pathology could actually provide in routine clinical practice. And all of this can be viewed on any kind of an internet enabled device. So the whole system and the flow is so seamless and so easy that it brings people from different uh, uh, from different specialities together on a simple single platform and there are multiple experts and opinions which can be collaborated and put into it at one point of time and you know you can come out with a more accurate diagnosis and that's what computational pathology will actually bring out. Now what are the benefits of computational pathology? Um, now when I'm talking about benefits, benefits hinge on the interpretation of existing data and uh, this ex existing data can be in the form of clinical notes, pharmacy data, vital signs, procedural tests, etc. And this can help when you have this whole lot of information, which you can actually pool in and arrive at a diagnosis, which is more accurate. It can help in determining disease likelihood and disease trend in advance of a complication setting. It can measure the quality and the cost to improve both within the healthcare system and inside the lab as well. It can actually serve as a hub related to a lot of data research, which can, which can happen, you know, both on the lab front and both on the clinical front as well. 
It can even provide an, an analytic basic for more precise patient selections in clinical trials. So these are some of the benefits that can actually come out with computational pathology. Uh, when I talk about computational pathology, I believe this is going to be the center of the future when it comes into hospital or clinical practice. Now, why do I say it's going to be the center tool? The, look at the arms which can branch out from computational pathology. First and foremost, the lab in itself, the workflow, the efficiency, the productivity of a pathologist, the turnaround time of our reports, and of course, the diagnostic accuracy, which is brought about by this reproducibility and the standardization of the kind of methodology that we would follow in bringing out interpretive reports. So that is one main area which can have a lot of benefits with computational pathology. The second is facilitating centralized services. For example, you have this hub and spoke model today where you have your reference lab and a lot of other labs out over there. You have a lot of other hospitals also which, with whom you might be having collaborations and samples getting sent. You can actually avoid this logistic transport of you know, slides and tissues and specimens you know, coming in. You can actually have a hub and spoke model where a computational pathology process can be put into place and that can facilitate centralized services. It can also enable telepathology and you can actually get expert review and opinion in real time basis. For example, you have a hemat expert in another part of the country and you want to you know, have them to look at this particular case. And if you have a computational pathology system and with a cloud based interface, you know, where you could share the, uh, the, the, the images, which is, you know, derived from the computational pathology and the rest of the information, you get an expert review in real time. So that saves time and cost for the patient as well. There is a big area of research which is happening in all kinds of departments in a hospital. It can be in the clinical research, it can be in laboratory research, biomedical informatics. So you can archive and save a lot of information, which can later on go in for a lot of research as well. So archival of data, quality assurance, having a lot of data to look at quality assurance, easy retrieval of data as it's, as it's all present on a cloud-based platform. It can also be helpful, you know, to track for patients, you know, for example, there was a relapse or a remission and the patient came after a couple of months. It would be so easy for you to retrieve all this data and then look back into the history again. And you have all of it, not just the lab data, you have the laboratory data, the clinical details, the, image, the imaging data, and the clinical notes, the uh, procedures that were done at that particular point of time, uh, and the vital signs during the time of discharge, you have it all in one bubble. And that's what commut computational pathology will bring all these departments together in under one umbrella. So these, this is how computational pathology I see would go into the future and become the central operational zone, which will command the processes, whether it is in a hospital, inside a lab, between various departments, between various hospitals in the city, or even across countries. And, and that's how extensively in computational pathology actually branch out. Now, we are all talking about precision medicine today, the delivery of precision medicine, and the underscores, and this underscores the importance of computational pathology again. And what are the key things that we need to look at when we talk about computational pathology in precision medicine? The first and foremost, the importance of being at the table at one's institution. And by this, I mean that there has to be an articulation of departmental leadership. There has to be an awareness that has to be spread in the pathology department, the importance of computational pathology, so that you can make appropriate infrastructural decisions and also in appropriate financial calls when you're thinking of laying out processes in a laboratory. The importance of interfacing with other non-pathology departments at one's institution. And this, as I suggested earlier, can be the pharmacy, radiological, clinical, surgical, the rest of the departments, and you have a certain interface where you can pull in data and look at it as a wholesome case, you know, rather than just looking at a specimen or a blood sample or a urine sample. And last but not least, the importance of sharing best practices amongst pathology departments across the country. So once you put a process into place and you're knowing that this is working out for you and you're getting the results, it's important to share that with the rest of the country and the rest of the pathology departments in the country as well. So um, in conclusion, what I would like to say, 
the field of computational pathology should be defined clearly and its value propositions should be clearly articulated. The value propositions for healthcare systems should be based on the central role of data-driven analysis in guiding care for the individual and across populations. Pathologists must take active roles in communicating value propositions with health system administrations, other departments, and our pathology colleagues across the country. And a culture should be created that views the computer or computation as a central tool, much like the microscope in anatomic pathology. Let me give a little bit of an example about how this can actually help in a, in a, in a wider way. Uh, um, I have worked in a cancer hospital for many years and uh, there's so much of ambiguity, you know, when it comes and a lot of biasness that also comes along with it. And it's not just enough that we look at a, a bone marrow or we look at a tissue biopsy and then we, you know, give out a diagnosis. You need to collaborate and correlate with a lot of other departments as well. For example, there is flow cytometry, there is immunohistochemistry, there's molecular, there is cytogenetics. And uh, it is very important for a clinician to finally get a collaborative report which sinks with all of these tests put together and that's where computational pathology will come into play so morphology is one aspect once you know the morphology you have a report based on that after that there can be recommendations given by computational pathology of what are the extra tests that need to be done and that could be flow cytometry or immunohistochemistry or molecular driven genetic analysis etc and all of this could be recommended by computational pathology itself. And finally, when the results of each of these departments are released, the computational pathology actually collaborates and correlates all these reports put together and finally arrives with a diagnosis in view of all these reports. And that is what should be finally presented in an actionable knowledge to a clinician where he can take the appropriate medical decision and, and an accurate medical decision, which is very, very important for patient care. Thank you, Dr. Itarajan, for that informative presentation on computational pathology and also for enlightening us as to how AI can help in scaling up the operations and increase the prediction accuracy in various fields of uh, pathology. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, during the earlier technical presentation, Mr. Manish spoke about the revolution of AI and how AI addresses the problem of uh, accuracy, affordability, accessibility. He also presented us uh, with uh, the use cases for self-care uh, triage diagnosis stages. He also explained how AI needs help from various other engineering fields to make AI more powerful. IOMT is one of them. Now, let us listen to Mr. Manish on Internet of Medical Things. Over to Mr. Manish. Uh, sorry, Mahesh Kumar series. I think, uh, Mr. Mahesh, you can share your screen, yeah. Thank you, Vaishrat. So, pleasure to be here. So, we are talking about Internet of Medical Things, IOMT, which is expected to reach uh, $158 billion in the next coming uh, couple of years, uh, probably by 2022. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to touch base with uh, three topics. One, we'll have a quick uh, examples with uh, related to AI, and then we, we are going to demystify what exactly is Internet of Medical Things. And at the end, we are going to end up with eight innovative IOMT applications. So this was the one uh, quick example from Arvind Eye Hospital, where if you look at in the world, we got close to 30 million people who are not able to see. Where Arvind Eye Hospital has kept a challenge where they want to scale a solution with that treatment where they are able to give their eyes back to them. And one of the idea they inspired by the way how a Xerox machine works, you know, for that you don't require a heavy training or something. So that's where they inspired and they created a model where we know that artificial intelligence can detect more than 50 diseases per eye. So that's where they developed an AI powered hardware where it can detect and even they can perform eye cathode operations very heavily. And how might we expand human life to 500 years? This is one of the crazy projects which Google is doing right now. 
if you look at this product is broken into three phases phase one understanding the human life of uh, the parameters and phase two arresting the age now I, if i am at 34 my age to be arrested even after one year also it has to be 34 so that is possible by doing some kind of uh, giving herbs and capsules some some kind of uh, other things as well and phase three would be going back to the age so if i am 35 going back to 25 so at the execution level google is done with the phase one where they are able to understand the parameters for a human life now they're at a phase two now this is the one uh, quick example from our backyard bengaluru a startup called nirmali where they, are, they developed a solution which is a non-contact non-invasive a radiation free method of detecting breast cancer for all Human groups at all age groups at the most early stage. Yashoda hospitals were the first hospitals in India who introduced robotic surgery, uh, what we call uh, Da Vinci surgical systems. Where usually when we do some uh, major uh, surgery uh, 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 operations, where you need a lot of uh, specialists. Instead, now where you can have a patient in the middle you can see there is a some six robotic arms are there which essentially the surgeons are through operating from these machines now one of the startup from hyderabad it's called nemocare they are trying to solve a born babies usually they have some kind of a, a breathing problems what uh, medically called apnea and uh, hypothermia so with the smart connect babies where they detect apnea and respiratory if you can see on the right hand side, that's the instrument what I'm talking. And even we have a virtual nurse, a virtual nurse, what we call is Omle, the world's first virtual nurse. Then the other example, just imagine an 18 years kid who is not even completed as a graduation, he's able to build a solution for the detecting breast cancer for women at a most early stage. When you compare to the accuracy of this product, when you compare to the famous oncologists, this product accuracy is a more. And KMCH launches the India's first for point of accuracy and precision through automation, uh, you know, cancer treatment. And if you look at what is common to the all game changing eight different solutions which we spoke. At the end, there is a deep embedded data product inside, which are developed using artificial intelligence. Now, in general, when you talk about artificial intelligence, it's broadly categorized into three. What we call is the ANI, artificial narrow intelligence. When a particular task is specified to one subject area, that is called ANI, artificial narrow intelligence, playing a chess riding a bicycle, driving a car. These are all one specific to one job. Now the second category is AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. When machines start in terms of intelligence, when it starts behaving equal to the human level, that is what we call AGI. Now this AI is, we have a huge breakthroughs in development perspective. We are here right now. And if you talk about the humans are known for the adapt adaptability, where I can drive my car in India, even I can drive my vehicle in Middle East, even in US. Now, what are the solution you built for autonomous, which is meant for USA, you can bring that vehicle. And if you ask him to drive in India conditions, it never, but whereas humans, can we do that? When this is possible, that is what we are talking about AGI, artificial general intelligence. When you say artificial super intelligence, when machines start behaving smarter than humans in all aspects, that is what we are saying, ASI. So the best example would be iRobot is the movie. If you see that uh, robot, it is extreme. Even uh, take example of uh, a Robo movie, from, uh, Rajnika movie, where the Chitti do a lot of uh, activities where humans cannot do, right? So don't worry, uh, there is a myth in the market where uh, robots are going to take us or something. That is not going to because at the end of the day humans meant for the intelligence so all the decision making is with us now when you say the disruptive technologies in healthcare 
So major one, if you look at surgical roboting tools, AI of course, connected device, 3D printing, smaller implants and digital platform integration, patent facing mobile apps, less invasive diagnostics. Now, if you go step back, let's zoom back. In general, if you look at, there are three generations of a software. Where if you go back to the 1970s, where we got the traditional database management system, which we used to store data in the form of a rows and column. Uh, EFCOR has proposed 12 rows, out of which eight has to satisfy, then it is known as the RDBMS. So using that data, we started you know, building softwares, which uh, we call enterprise software. So especially leveraging business intelligence and ERP tools where people, the business people were entering the data. Now, let's say somebody has to uh, in a, uh, take example of a banking system. Typically, when you are trying to deposit, the people will tell her they used to enter your account number and they used to record all the transactions. And after some time, we got ERP systems in place. And from 2000 to 2010, where we got more specific to the consumer software where humans being created data. And from 2010 to 2020 era, if you look at where we got analytics in place, big computing in picture, where we got huge developments happen in terms of the software as well, hardware perspective. And majority of the IoT economy, if you look at, is driven by sensors. Now that's where we are talking about more specific to the IoT, Internet of things. Now, which is one subcategory under IOT, what we is, what we call is Internet of Medical Things, IOMT. Now, what is IOMT? The Internet of Medical Things refers to the connected system of medical devices and application that collects data that is, uh, sorry, that is then uh, provide to healthcare IT systems through online computer networks. The IOT, IOMT can help monitor, inform, and notify not only care divorce, but provide healthcare providers with actual data to identify the issues before they become critical or to allow the earlier invention. So in general, if you look at where you were, AI will become the core algo, the algorithm, and remaining, whether you say IoT, whether you say 3D printing, drone, all this will become, even including robotics, this will become your infrastructure or a hardware layer, which you usually the right, the piece of code using algorithms in AI. Now, if you look at, there are two broad categories of IOMT. One is clinical, another one is non-clinical. Under clinical, you got wearables and implants, and non-clinical, you got equipment, location-based trackers, sensors for legacy devices. Now let's look at each of this. When you say wearables, this basically include the major of the cases biosensors, which we use for monitoring blood pressure, heart rhythm, respiratory rate, blood, oxygen, saturation, etc. When you say implants, they include Injectable or implantable sensors used for tumor detection, tracking, genomic signals, drug tailoring, and inflammation detection. Similarly, when it comes to the non-clinical, where you got the equipment, it includes beside monitors, smart beds, community classics, medication dispensers, and medical trackers as well. Location-based trackers, where you can have RFID tags, use it to tracking patent movement and sensors for legacy devices, which includes the sensors that are used to simplify, transmit the data captured by legacy biomedical devices. Now, what kind of devices are we connected to the IOMT? Fitness variables, as majority of the people nowadays, if you look at uh, Apple Watch, with that, where even you can uh, call to some emergency people if somebody is sick, right? So that's where we are talking about the wearables and clinical grade wearables, remote patient monitoring devices, smart pills, point of care devices and QSX and clinical monitors and hospital devices. So these are the few examples when you talk about the devices which are connected to IOMT. 
Now, in general, if you look at, there are three broad categories where we can have a, a specific IOMT use cases, leveraging AI as well. So one is the care delivery, where you can have a breast cancer screening, then uh, preliminary symptom-based diagnosis, radiolog radiology inferences, and cancer treatment options. Now, other side, if you look at operational ex uh, excellence, you got uh, ICU with uh, vitals monitoring, transmit data from legacy biomedical devices. And the third, when you say customer experience, patient appointment scheduling and indoor navigation. These are the few broad IOMT use cases. Now let's look at eight innovative developments for IOMT. So one, IOMT movement detector. For immobile patients are those that are around, it is essential to detect the slight movements on the body. That's why smart monitors and sensors are placed in the clothing, bed, that can be helped with the tracking involuntary movements to provide better insights for the diagnosis. Now, when you look at the fitness tracking system, fitness tracking and diagnosis, where you, with, with the having that kind of a sensor attached to wherever, whether it's a watch or a clock, you can get all the insights, whether it's a blood pressure or nerves, even, nowadays even you can uh, get the body posture of a bone as well. Now, when it's specific to the cyclist, when he's doing the cycling with this format, even you can get his body posture and even you can analyze, is there any, with that data, what is the possible possibility of getting an injury? And uh, real-time patent health monitoring. One of the best example would be DogBox, DOC, DOX, which is a prime example of patent monitoring platform, where essentially you can get all the uh, uh, vitals to monitor specifically for a patient. And the other example would be ingestible sensor and cameras. And here the other best example would be check cap, which is uh, revolutionary the way how they are doing things in IOMT. Then we got uh, emergency response systems, then connected inhaler delivery system, smart continuous glucose monitoring and asset monitoring and maintenance. So these are the eight AI, uh, sorry, IOMT applications which widely used by the industry right now. So I would like to end up with uh, one parting thought. The illiterate of 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn by Alvin Toffler. Thanks for the opportunity, I, I true. It was a pleasure to have you as a speaker here once again. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mahesh, uh, for giving us an overview on practical applications of uh, IOMT in clean, non-clinical uh, areas. Now, uh, it's a time to listen to Mr. Amit Kamath. He will speak about 3D segmentation using deep learning. That's AI revolutionizing healthcare. Over to you, Amit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shetty. Uh, let me quickly try to, uh, if I can share my screen uh, very quick and uh, make sure oh. that my presentation... Oh, we cannot see you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, can you see me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Great. Okay, cool. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen as well. Um, I know I have about 15 minutes and uh, if my audio is good, I'll get started. You can start, yes. Perfect. Uh, so thank you uh, for uh, having me here. My name is Amit. Uh, I work at a company called the MathWorks. Let me get rid of this. Um, and um, um, I'm going to talk for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, maybe slightly lesser, uh, about uh, deep learning and how AI is really re revolutionizing healthcare, right? Um, so the agenda is I'll, I'll quickly do a, a short round of introductions about myself and um, I'll have three stories to talk about. Uh, I'll start with what can such systems, um, uh, you know, AI is, is this broad um, uh, topic, but then what can systems that do deep learning uh, can do for you, right? 
the second um, story would be how they do it. Uh, you know, we, we'll try to look into the guts of one subsystem and hopefully have you understand um, uh, what's under the hood, right? Uh, and finally, um, I, I'll end with, um, uh, I'm guessing most uh, of, of the audience here are really consumers of, of this tech. Um, so so uh, a quick round of uh, how can you gain from this and, and how, how can you, uh, as a consumer, also contribute, right? And we'll summarize this, okay? So um, a really quick introduction uh, of how I got interested in medical imaging, right? So um, uh, this kind of um, uh, left to right um, is um, the, the process called uh, tractography, right? So you go from MRI scans uh, on the left um, and you have this kind of every, you know, volume element called a voxel in your data that's captured is this kind of blob of, 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 uh, of cells, right? Um, how do you go from this blob of cells into some understanding of the orientation of the, um, um, you know, uh, white matter, for example, um, uh, uh, in, you know, in the, um, uh, in each volume? And then using that, um, how can you, uh, come up with uh, an understanding of the general connectivity between point A in the brain to point B, right? Uh, so this whole process is called um, uh, digital tractography. Um, and my research, um, uh, the, when I started with medical imaging, uh, was to optimize the step from, you know, going from this blob, uh, roughly two millimeter by two millimeter by two millimeter, right, in, in, in volume, uh, to uh, getting this understanding, right? Um, so uh, if you take a long time, for example, uh, to, to, to compute this, it's just, you know, more um, slower in terms of uh, having, uh, you know, you need more data, uh, you know, you need to collect more data, and then you need more time to actually come up with this kind of approximation, right? So, so to optimize this was, was how I get started. Um, you know, just a, a closer view at, at, at how we try to do this. Um, this is called uh, diffusion tensor imaging, the modality uh, for MR data that we collect. So at every voxel uh, in the brain, so this is a slice um, where, you know, for every voxel we have kind of an estimation of the intensity and sort of the angle of, uh, in three dimensions, right? Of, uh, of how the uh, nerve fibers are um, oriented, right? So the larger red regions here are uh, stronger intensities of um, uh, fibers in a particular direction. But then, if it's more uh, greener and kind of uh, you know flatter in some sense, uh, we don't have a good um, uh, major direction in some sense, right? Um, so there's a lot of math that 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 goes on behind this. There's this thing called spherical harmonics, which is how we um, um, model this kind of data. And then uh, we used uh, something called a bioexponential decay model uh, in k-space. So k-space is the um, you know um, uh, space in which you, you, you compute or you extract these samples and then we reconstruct this um, in the actual uh, uh, domain, right? Um, spatial domain. Um, you know, we could achieve um, a pretty good understanding of between 40 to 30 degrees is where we could distinguish uh, fibers that kind of connected with each other in some way um, or, or, or had uh, overlaps. Uh, and so that was pretty good. This was back in 2012. Uh, you know, things now have probably changed quite a bit. Um, so the three takeaways I want you uh, to, to, to go back home with um, after this talk is um, the first one is deep learning um, has already and is advancing state of the art in automated uh, medical limit segmentation, among many other things. Uh, you'll hear a lot more about artificial neural networks. Uh, you know, these days uh, they can model data and problems of ever increasing complexity, right? Uh, so this is the earlier we're all familiar with this, you know, what this is, the better it is, right? Uh, finally, all of this is not magic. Um, you can contribute, you can curate and annotate data for those of us, people like me, who don't have domain expertise. We are not medically, uh, you know, clinically trained doctors. Um, so, uh, so, so to help us build such systems using your domain expertise, uh, you can contribute as well, okay? So to focus a little on the first uh, takeaway, what can such systems do, right? Um, here's an example of the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, what they've done is going from, um, you know, this is a, an example of, uh, I believe, Dr. Renu's talk about um, uh, uh, computational pathology, right? You go from uh, pathology slides like this to labeled portions um, that, that correspond to certain um, uh, pathologies, right? 
Um, so to do this sort of manually a, a, as a human um, would be a, a rather difficult task, right? Um, and, and so to automatically do this uh, is called semantic segmentation, right? Uh, and these are pretty large slides and um, using deep learning techniques um, to go from this representation of the image itself to this labeled um, kind of uh, representation where you can then do more statistics and say, okay, so, you know, if the um, orange region is larger than a certain uh, size, then there's a problem, right? So you can then uh, come up with um, statistics of that sort, right? Uh, so this is called semantic segmentation, and I'll show you how, how this can be done in 3D as well, right? Um, Gene and Tech is a popular, um, a well-known um, um, uh, company, uh, pharma company, and, and they've used um, uh, convolutional neural networks. So these are one type of uh, deep neural networks. They've used this uh, to generate uh, training data iteratively, right? So if you remember from Dr. Shah's talk, I believe uh, he mentioned, you know, you need good quality training data to, to make these systems good uh, and, and accurate, right? Um, so you can do this iteratively as well. So imagine you have a lot of data now, uh, but then every day you keep adding more and more data. Uh, so you can iteratively improve this um, and, and, and then it kind of uh, removes the need to annotate by hand, which is great. So this is automation uh, at, at another level uh, altogether. Uh, these uh, slide images, again, this is again pathology, um, 25K by 25K. So, you know, one megapixel is like, you know, 1K by 1K. Um, these days, cameras are, are, you know, going crazy in terms of megapixels, but these images are massive, right? 25K by 25K. There are, um, specific um, architectures of neural networks. This one particularly is called UNET, very popular in the medical space again. Uh, so UNET was used to do, um, uh, to, to kind of generate this data uh, also, okay? Um, another example is this university in Japan. Um, what they've done is uh, they've used deep neural networks to reduce radiation exposure, right? Um, so this is going back to, you know, the how I got interested in, in, in medical imaging, right? Um, the, the longer your subject or patient uh, has to be under the scanner, the, the, the riskier it is um, for their, um, uh, you know, uh, for them being exposed to this kind of radiation, right? Uh, so with more intelligent methods of uh, reconstructing uh, this kind of data, um, you can um, acquire data that's, that's um, you, you can think of it as, uh, you know, low dose and uh, for, for a shorter period of time, uh, but then reconstruct a fairly accurate and, and a high resolution, uh, in some sense, um, uh, images, uh, even without uh, spending that time to acquire it, right? Uh, so there are plans uh, to deploy this in a clinical setting going forward. Um, another example, and, and this is the 3D um, uh, part of this, right? So uh, these days there are systems, uh, in fact, this is a, a link to a data set. Uh, so this was part of the Mikai conference, uh, I believe, last year. Um, and, um, you know, there are systems that people are developing to automatically detect humans, right? Um, so, you know, they have, um, uh, this data set in particular is called the BRATS data set. They have four different, um, uh, modalities of MR, um, uh, data and, uh, you know, using 484, um, samples of, of training, um, uh, you, you know, you can, you can then build a system that, that, that can, um, label every voxel. So every element, um, in your uh, in, in your data uh, as tumor or not or not tumor, right? Uh, if you also remember um, from from Dr. Shah's talk, I believe again um, that that you know you have to start with training data, right? So to, to label this data is very laborious, uh, and and hence that's the advantage of doing this automatically as well, right? So if you build such a system and, and then have it do the uh, uh, computation for you. Um, that's that's really cool. It, it, it makes everyone's life that much that much easier and and uh, and better uh, to use these tools for for the um, uh, investigation. Right? Um, so you know uh, this is sort of an example. Hopefully the video is playing okay on your screens. Uh, you know the, the, the red portion here um, you know could potentially be be, be automatically uh, detected, right? Uh, and and the rest of the portions can be left as it is. Um, and that way, you know, it indicates to you that, you know, there is a tumor and it's of this particular size. And then you can do other statistics based on uh, automatically detecting this, right? Uh, you could do this manually, obviously, um, but, but it's going to take, it's, you know, obviously this has to be done by a neurologist or a neuro neurosurgeon. You need domain expertise. 
you need to have that kind of understanding. Uh, instead, you could kind of build this kind of deep neural network and this will kind of do it for you, right? Um, in, the, in the urology world, uh, particularly, um, uh, you, you could apply this to uh, kidney segmentation problems as well, right? Where um, um, there are traditional methods as well, um, where you can, um, Uh, interactivity where you can draw these uh, red and, and green regions to say what regions you're interested in, and then it can kind of build this kind of boundary for you. Um, imagine doing this is, you know, drawing the red and green regions here are easier than actually manually tracing this, this border, right? Uh, for one image, it's, it's all right, I guess, but for, imagine you have thousand images, what do you do, right? Uh, this is clearly easier. Also, you can do this in 3D too, right? So these are two papers, uh, I believe from 2018, this segmentation. Uh, this one particularly is again from diffu uh, diffusion MR data um, uh, to um, um, you know, construct this kind of 3D model uh, with which you can do uh, guided surgeries and so on, right? Um, so now that we've seen what these systems um, can do, um, I'll spend some time on, on how these systems do it, right? What are artificial neural networks? Now, um, Dr. Shah has done an amazing job actually um, uh, telling you what AI is, how it's related to machine learning, deep learning, and what, what the subsections are and so on. I'll try to reiterate with a few more graphic uh, examples here. So traditionally, uh, what programming was, was you obviously start with a computer and then you have some data, you write a program and then you get outputs, right? So this is how we all generally understand programming is. Um, but then learning from data, uh, this whole AI space, uh, machine learning in particular, uh, you notice the output and program has switched places and the program is now called a model, right? So you start with data, you start with the corresponding outputs. This is again, what's called the supervised learning problem where you have data and labels, right? And using this combination, we can build intelligent models that can then work on new data and, and give its estimate of the corresponding output, right? So essentially machine learning is really the art of building such computer programs that improve with experience. You give it more data, more outputs, um, correspo corresponding outputs, they build better and better models, right? Um, and so how are these terms related? Um, clearly, again, uh, Dr. Shah covered this, um, you know, AI is this broad uh, overarching topic. Machine learning is a subsection. And then deep learning is, is a even smaller subset um, under machine learning, okay? Now, deep learning is really, um, ha has taken off uh, literally um, in, in the past several years. And, and why it's done this is because it learns to perform tasks directly from data, right? So with machine learning, um, in fact, um, you know, this is the, um, you know, the slide which talks about the difference between the two, right? Traditionally, um, we had to, as engineers or as domain experts, uh, handcraft what are called features, right? Uh, so for, in this example of, of vehicles, uh, you wanna say, okay, looking at this image, is it a car, truck or a bicycle or several other classes, right? We had to handcraft features and then have this classification model. You know, you, you, you may remember naive base, k-means and so on, right? Um, so, so you can do classification using several different model types, support vector machine, right? Uh, so we had to do this handcrafting features um, in the past. And, and so the features that needed to be um, uh, constructed depended very much on the problem itself. So for vehicles, maybe uh, detecting edges, detecting lines and so on um, are features, right? But if you want to generalize this, uh, it, it becomes very difficult. You can't use features for a car um, in case of detecting if it's a cat or a dog, because cats are furry, dogs are furry, uh, lines won't give you any details, right? Uh, so instead, deep learning is this kind of, you know, um, uh, system through which um, this convolutional neural network can do this feature learning uh, by itself. And that's the real advantage. That's the real uh, genius behind these systems so that you only work with the data. Clearly, you need more data than before, right, for it to learn the features. And then it will also give you the classification outputs, right? So it's end to end, right? Um, a classic problem um, in artificial intelligence or, or, or deep learning is called image classification, right? So essentially, if you look at this image as humans, we can say, okay, is this a watermelon? No, it's not. 
Is this a pedestrian? No, no, it's not. Uh, maybe it's crossing the road. It's still not a pedestrian, right? Uh, is it a peacock? And then we can say, yes, it is, right? Um, so when the input to your black box, if you imagine, is a color image, a red, green, blue image, right? And the output is what does this image contain? Um, if you can build this black box system that can do this, you're solving the image classification problem, okay? Um, the semantic segmentation problem, on the other hand, is slightly more nuanced, right? You start with an image like this, let's say a slice of, of, of the human brain, right? Uh, for every region, every pixel uh, in this input, if you can then categorize that into, you know, is this is this white matter? Is this gray matter? Is this um, the surrounding skull region, right? Uh, going from here to here, this is called the semantic segmentation uh, problem, right? So your input is, let's say, a gray color image, and the output is, what is each pixel? Is it tumor? Is it non-tumor? Is it, um, you know, um, anatomical um, region of interest or not, and so on, right? Um, so very briefly, how does a pixel go through this thing called a CNN, a convolutional neural network? So you may have heard earlier that, you know, there are these layers, right? Uh, so it's abstracted into this these things called layers, which do a bunch of things. So there are uh, se several names. There's something called convolution. There's ReLU, pooling, and so on. And then there's this classification head at the end, right? Uh, so one of the first few um, deep neural networks, AlexNet came out in 2012, um, it had five convolutional layers and then three of these fully connected layers. And so in total, it had 62 million parameters, right? So it's really, really complex and hence can model complex data, right? So what does this do? Um, it really learns patterns, right? So so if you, if you can think of going deeper and deeper into the network, and, and that's kind of why it's called a deep neural network and hence deep learning, right? There are many, many, many layers the, the more layers you have, the deeper your network is, deeper your neural network is, right? So the way it works at a very, very high level is um, in the first few layers, it learns simple patterns, like simple colors and simple edges and so on. And when you go deeper and deeper, it learns more uh, interesting patterns, right? Um, so here you have very basic uh, edges and colors and so on. Here you have slightly more, um, you know, combinations of these uh, features or patterns are put together. These are the, the things that, that this layer learns. If you go even deeper, there are more and more complex features. As an analogy, you can think of that as, let's say you're analyzing a sentence, um, you know, the, the first few layers learn alphabets. How many A's are in your sentence and so on, right? And as you go deeper and deeper, you learn higher level features. You learn idioms and phrases, and then you can try to make out what that sentence is, right? Uh, and finally, using these patterns, you can say, okay, I see this pattern, this pattern, and this pattern, and this combination of these patterns indicate to me that this image has a goldfish, uh, it is a goldfish, right? As opposed to these other categories. Uh, so that's kind of how, you know, all of these pixels kind of go through your, your layers and then end up as one of these categories for a classification problem, okay? Now, um, what's cool is we have, a lot of compute power um, to do this now, which is great, uh, but we need labeled or annotated data, right? Uh, and that is where I think is the third takeaway for you is how can you contribute, right? Um, so this is sort of a chart of AI uh, adoption, right? So this is 2018, in fact, and, and already uh, a fair number of people have already, uh, you know, done planning and, and are into kind of executing, uh, integrating AI into their systems, right? Uh, and now it's probably even even more um, uh, predominant. Um, so AI agents can do very interesting things. So here's a quick uh, demonstration of how you can you know run such a system in MATLAB, right? Uh, very like five lines of code, and you can say this image contains a peacock, right? Um, but they don't work all the time, right? So we can do the same thing for another image, uh, let's say peppers, uh, which is right here, and then our system will say, okay, this is a bell pepper, but clearly this has many more things. It has a garlic uh, pod, it has some chilies, some tomatoes and so on. Um, so why does this not work, right? Um, so these systems clearly work on knowledge that it has been trained on, right? Um, so this AlexNet that I spoke about earlier has been trained on 1000 categories, um, but capsicum, for example, if you expected this to say capsicum um, uh, or uh, let's say uh, red chili, right? Uh, those categories were not trained. Um, the, the system was not trained on that, right? And that's why it, it can't tell you that. 
So really, the, 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 you know, the, the, the message in, in this particular slide is annotating data, starting with good um, data to, um, to use um, uh, to train these systems is critical to its performance, right? Um, and, and so here's a quick, you know, in research, a lot of people spend a lot of time in sort of the models and the algorithms and, you know, should I use, um, uh, you know, neural network X versus neural network Y? Uh, but in the industry, uh, in fact, people spend a lot of time curating and managing their data set itself. Okay. And so the ask from, from all of you, I guess, is, um, you know, coming from a clinical background, there are several different uh, in the deep learning and machine learning um, um, two-dimensional space, um, uh, so as to speak. Um, there are various different types of models we can build, uh, various different flavors of AI that we can come up with. Um, but 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 you can help create um, these systems by, by 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 sharing your data with um, uh, obviously with uh, you know all the um, um, anonymization and all of that. But but if you can share annotations, that is where you put your knowledge into this kind of system and transfer that in some way to these neural networks, right? Uh, so that's where I think you um, as as clinicians and surgeons and and people in the academia in general uh, can contribute uh, in building these systems. Uh, so in summary, really, uh, the three points are deep learning has advanced uh, state-of-the-art already uh, in the medical image segmentation world. Uh, neural networks are everywhere. You will hear much more about them in the years to come. And then finally, um, uh, you can help um, uh, build these systems by uh, curating and annotating data. Uh, that's about it. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope I uh, stuck to time. Um, you, you are absolutely fine, uh, Mr. Kamath. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, we are now moving on to the Q&A section. And uh, Amit, because you've been the last presenter, can I just mm -hmm. ask uh, you yeah. the first question? Yeah. Now, uh, we are clinicians. We, you know, Our problems are clinical related. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them is related to surgical planning. And what right. we've traditionally been involved is with things like 3D printing or cognitively understanding our imaging and yeah. using that information to perform surgery. Yeah. How much do you think technology can be involved in making this art more precise, making it more of a science? Right. Uh, is, is the question that I'd like to ask you and perhaps even Mahesh, uh, who's in, involved in IOMT. So uh, Amit, for you to take over. Cool, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's a great question. So. Um, uh, I guess, like you mentioned, uh, surgery these days is kind of uh, uh, an art plus a science in some way. Um, and, and using um, imaging uh, modalities these days, let's say uh, the diffusion image um, um, a modality that, that we saw in a slide earlier, where you can kind of get a sense of the ge geometry of, of, of organs, let's say kidneys, um, um, with, with a fair degree of accuracy. Right? Um, the, in my limited understanding, I, I think we are... Uh, already a, a fair distance into um, um, building such systems. I'd say maybe you know 50 to 70 percent um, uh, capable of, of, of helping out finding angles and finding the the orientations on, on how to um, uh, you know uh, uh, make incisions in, into these uh, organs. Uh, what I think can help going forward is again more data, right? Um, if you can help us with 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 labeling this this data telling us what part is really part of the kidney, giving us a better understanding of the actual morphology of the, uh, of the organs. Uh, and that way we can build more and more precise uh, systems. Uh, clearly in the medical world, uh, you know, 90% accuracy is not good enough, right? Uh, so, so we'd want more. So that's my quick answer. Um, yeah. Mahesh, would you like to add on to that? No, go on. It's fine. He covered, almost Amit is covered. <laughs> Okay, fine. Uh, uh, Dr. Shetty, is there a question you'd like to ask? Yes. Uh, how do you compare the tools uh, the MATLAB uh, with the Python, especially uh, in the AI domain? Right, right. Dr. Shetty, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, so um, for those of you who may not be aware, so I, I work for a company called the MatWorks and MATLAB is the, the tool that we, we, we build. Um, so Python is a general purpose open source programming language. Um, these days, there are several frameworks that you can you can you can use to build these AI systems, and uh, all of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. Right? Um, so, um, um, 
I, I cannot give a definitive answer and say this one's always better than the other. Um, each tool has its own um, um, uh, pluses and minuses. Uh, from the MATLAB and MathWorks side, though, I can say that um, we have several tools that make it easy for you to um, get started with this with this um, uh, topic, right? So, for example, like, like like Dr. Shah mentioned, he said naive base and discriminant and SVMs and so on. Uh, we have graphical tools that can help you just run your models and compare all of them at the same time um, and, and find out which one runs faster, which one's more accurate. Um, <coughs> if, if you don't have a, 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 a strong uh, programming background, uh, using these tools might be easy, right? Uh, on the other hand, for example, if, if you're very, very familiar with um, uh, building these models and all the parameters, maybe Python or, or another language can give you much more uh, control over things, right? Performance may be something else that you're worried about. Uh, so, so my, uh, you know, uh, bottom line, I guess, is use the best tool that that you are comfortable with and what makes your job easy. Uh, if it is MATLAB, um, uh, I'd be happy to help. Uh, Amit, uh, just one more question. Yes, yes. Uh, you spoke about the importance of having a clean data. Yes, yes. Uh, is there a standard format where we can write templates for data, or how is it, or is it based on the comfort of the person? Right, right, right. So, so in fact, um, um, it, you know, uh, curating data these days has itself become an industry. There are several startups uh, um, that, that that deal with managing data, right? Um, label data, particularly. And so, in the medical world, uh, for example, there are uh, well-known standard formats. Uh, DICOM is one very popular. There's one called Nifty, specifically for functional um, uh, MR data, right? Um, so, so again, there's no general answer that, that that I can give for all kind of scenarios. Depending on the kind of problem you're trying to tackle and trying to solve, um, there are several different formats, but but they're fairly well established in most. You know, for autonomous driving, for example, there are several formats um, of, of data that that you can help annotate. Um, so, so um, I guess the, the the bottom line answer is it depends on the kind of things you're working. Thank you. Or Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, could I ask uh, Dr. Etirajan, uh, there's a question for yourself. Uh, Dr. Etirajan, one of the challenges in pathological evaluation is there is a certain degree of subjectivity. There is a, perhaps a lot of inter-observer variability as well. And as uh, Amit said earlier on, our acceptance of, uh, of, of false uh, negative or a false diagnosis is perhaps very low. How do you think computational pathology uh, can address this issue? Do you see it as a uh, way we can address this issue, Dr. Ethirajan? Uh, yes, Dr. Rai, you're very right about this uh, observer variability at the uh, subjectivity that comes into uh, looking at the morphological uh, you know, features and giving a diagnosis. And I have seen it in real time during my practice. And uh, that is something which AI in pathology or even computational pathology should be able to address. First and foremost, um, AI is trained on billions of data. So it's literally bombarded with all kinds of permutations and combinations, even including the pre-analytical variations that could be there in a particular you know, morphological interpretation. That's one thing. And uh, uh, these are annotated. So these, uh, the data which is given to the, uh, al the, uh, for the, for the building of the algorithms, these are annotated by experts in the field. And that's in millions. So obviously the AI learns a lot. Uh, compared to what a human mind can actually learn even in a lifespan and it's, it's a process of continuous learning as it receives billions of data from different kinds of institutions uh, different kinds of stains um, etc specimens etc so uh, obviously it has learned so much that uh, the level of sensitivity specificity and accuracy is pretty high and i'm not just saying this by you know uh, some kind of an experience by just looking at the data which i've seen we have actually backed it up with validation studies so when we do a validation study and we've compared it to ground truth, we have seen sometimes we have been able to surpass the results given by an automated analyzer, for instance, which has a lot of errors. As you know, hematological analyzer or any other automated analyzer in a lab has its own limitations. Not always is it accurate, which mandates manual microscopy. And that is why we, the pathologist is still going back to the microscope. But again, how good is a, pathology, a pathologist trained? 
how, how much is their experience? I mean, that could really vary from place to place and pathologist to pathologist. So there is no standardization and reproducibility. And that's where AI can bring that in. And it's all about pattern recognition. You won't believe it. We once in fact had a case of monoblastic leukemia, which is very, very difficult to diagnose even for some experts, you know, pro-monoblast, monocytes, uh, it, it's very difficult. And and, and it really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a confusion zone. It's a gray zone. But when I saw how the AI actually interpreted it, not only did it, you know, um, give the accurate diagnosis, I saw how it derived that logic. We found that the classification of the bucket of monos, monoblasts actually was derived from the monocyte bucket. So it has learned like a child, you know, what is A, B, C, D, and put it into a sentence and then into a pattern. AI has a systematic way of actually uh, giving out a report and it is based on uh, pattern recognition, morphological recognition, and also an analysis of data which is from billions of sources. And so it is definitely far more accurate and, and th there's no ambiguity or biasness which the human mind could have. So that's, that's, that's kind of a weakness, I think, which a human mind could have. And then accessibility to other kinds of data, which sometimes can be a limitation. But with computational pathology, we help to overcome that as well, where we can collaborate and you know, put everything together, as I said in my talk, and give a far more accurate diagnosis than what a human mind could actually give. Why, why do you think uh, its wider applicability is still, uh, some would argue, still quite limited, if, if it's as accurate? Uh, it, the applicability of computational pathology is still yeah. limited. So I think it first comes with the awareness. Uh, see, a lot of people have not experienced it. You need to dabble with AI for a while, you know. In fact, when I initially started out my journey with AI, I would, you know, do a comparison of what the AI result was with my manual microscopy. I would get goosebumps at times, you know, when it would be bang on the diagnosis. And that's something and I would actually think maybe the AI actually has a mind of its own, you know. And probably there is some person there, there's a brain actually, which is actually developing out over there. But that is something and that confidence would actually come when you actually get into that field and experience it. You need to uh, dabble with a few cases, you know, and then and, and figure out for yourself, you know, and validate yourself probably and see how good or bad it actually can be. As far as I know, it can actually bring down the pain point for a pathologist in, in, a, in a lot of way. It can help with baseline screening and uh, uh, bring out a lot of accuracy, which you should be actually be surprised to see. But for that, we need to get into it and use it as a tool and to see how it, we can actually overcome our errors. And I think uh, there's a lot of error whether it's in the lab front or in the medical front, there are errors and we all know it. And there has to be a more standardized way of looking at how we can overcome and, you know, uh, get accuracy in that particular zone. And even for that question, which Mr. Purushottam actually asked, what could be the percentage difference? You know, sometimes a percentage difference can be really quite vast. You know, from it's, it's very difficult sometimes for a human mind to label something as just an abnormal cell. Is it dysplastic? Is it pre-malignant? Is it malignant? And then again, when you're grading the malignancy, you know, is it intermediate? Is it whatever is the grade of malignancy? There is so much of subjectivity which actually goes into that. And there are so many opinions which are taken. And as, as you know, you can get a different kind of an opinion from one organization and another institution. These kind of things happen and we know that. But when it comes to an AI, that ambiguity is not going to be there. So sometimes the percentage of uh, uh, the accuracy could be far better than what a human mind can actually, you know, uh, give out over there. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shetty, uh, is there something you'd like to ask? And Madam, now we talk of AI and it needs lots of computational, you know, it's still, uh, to use AI, you need to have a computational culture uh, within your department. True, true. How do you create a computational culture actually? So first of all, I feel, uh, according to me, I think there should be a strong and a clear vision of what you're getting into. Means why do you even need computational pathology? There has to be a vision out over there. And based on that vision, there has to be a departmental leadership which can bring all disciplines together under one umbrella and see what, what we can derive out of computational pathology. Secondly, there should be a presence of strong informatics in the system. Thirdly, I feel there should be a long-term resident engagement. Like you should start early. This is not something that should be, you know, started in medical practice when you have, you know, once become an expert and then, you know, it has to be incorporated in the learning stages as well. In fact, I feel informatics, bio, bioinformatics, AI, these should be in fact subjects, 
even in MBBS, you know, so that we learn early and we, we understand the advantages of this very early. And perhaps, you know, the teaching discipline should be incorporated as a part of the pathology domain. You know, we could have engineers, you know, working uh, with the pathologists. They could be residents who are learning what is, how to build algorithms. You know, it, it, it has to be a two-way street out over there. And that's how a wholesome culture can be actually created between the different disciplines in the hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shetty, do you mind if I ask a question to Mahesh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mahesh, uh, I mean, clearly, I think today's webinar demonstrates that all the technologies, artificial intelligence has uh, is going to impact the healthcare significantly. Do you think we're just in the early stages still? And there's a lot more to be achieved. Uh, like self-driven cars are being talked about. Will we have a situation where operations are going to be done by machines soon as well? Yes, it is going to take some more time. But uh, when you talk about autonomous vehicles, yes, uh, because if you look at the ecosystem of uh, autonomous vehicles, in which 5% of companies are from automotive background, and remaining 95%, if you look at Tesla, they never they created any car in the past, right? So now, in that way, if you look at 95% are technical background with having AI capability and remaining all 5% companies who had some past experience, you know, manufacturing cars. So with that, if you look at, as I was talking about the categories of uh, AI, AGI, ASI, so as we are pretty through with uh, AMI, artificial narrow intelligence, now we are at artificial general intelligence. So going forward, autonomously, it's not only uh cars autonomous technology when you say robotics a lot of things are coming even if you take example of uh, uh, tennis every time when you have that ball somebody has to pick that balls you just imagine now we have a machine when a cricketer is practicing no need to throw a ball where you have autonomous ball even for all the games so that's what i'm talking it's not only a self-driving cars or technology when it comes to the automotive Autonomously, it's all, whether you talk about a manufacturing industry, you've got a huge robotics with, you know, autonomous operations. So going forward, uh, we'll have a very huge disruption with this uh, robotics plus AI, which is a combo. I just want to, I mean, I was, I was slightly joking when I asked about autonomous operating, but I think one of the things that we, as surgeons, one of the challenges that we have is the, like I was asking uh, Amit earlier on, we are reliant on pre-operative assessment. We have some cognitive understanding of where structures are. But we have sat navs today, which tell us you turn to the left and you'll reach your destination. Do you think it's time for us as surgeons or medics and uh, engineers to combine our knowledges and operate where we have some sort of prompt to tell us if you go in this direction, you'll reach the organ of uh, interest, uh, or if you go in that direction, you'll it'll be dangerous and you mustn't go there. Do you think that kind of technology can be developed? Yes, uh, because at the end of the day, if you look at AI is all about uh, data junk in, junk out. So as you got huge data, much, much data, when with that, you're going to build a model and your results will be accurate. As it's all together at the end of the day, it's all about your data. When your data is noisy, obviously your models, your outcome, everything would be a noisy. It's all depend upon the data. That's where always we say data is the new oil and now the new uh, uh, word, what we call data is the new currency. Fantastic. Dr. Shetty? No questions from my side. Yeah, we'll move on to the next. Okay. okay. Uh, I'd like to ask Professor Sumru. Uh, Prof, you've, you've uh, spoken extensively about the future of surgery. Uh, you've trained surgeons for over 30 years now. You've gone from a situation where our uh, strategy was see one, uh, do one, uh, see one, assist one, and do one, and to more structured training programs today. How far do you think we are? before AI is uh, integrated into teaching curriculums and surgical curriculums? Uh, thank you, Bhavan. I'll, I'll answer that question, but I was very uh, keenly interested in uh, lots of talk about data. 
I think if you allow me a few minutes, I'll talk about what uh, the ecosystem currently in the UK is. Uh, Department of Industries and Business in the UK has allocated one billion pounds in healthcare data, and there are many initiatives. So I think there is lots of focus on data. I think, first of all, we, we, there was a mention of, uh, uh, maybe Amit said, that please give us uh, uh, structured data. And I will refer to, I think it was IBM in 2017, we suggested that 80% of all the data available has been actually accumulated in two years prior to that. And it is stated that three quarters of all the data that we have is healthcare data. And again, three quarters of that data is unstructured data. So that's, that's where we are, that healthcare is the predominant uh, producer of data and that is unstructured, which is cannot be used. So what uh, Department of Health is doing, actually it has created multiple structures to store data, that they are data repositories and these are called data alliances. These are not individual hospitals, but zonal universities and institutions for the whole the North, like coming from, you would know, uh, Bhavan from Manchester, i.e. M62 onwards, so there's one data repository for that, and so on and so forth. There are six data repositories being formed in the UK, regional based. In addition to that, there are disease-specific data hubs being created, and that's what you're trying to do for surgery. So for ophthalmology, for the whole country, there's one data hub. Uh, for for uh, cancer, there's another data hub. For ophthalmology, there's another data hub. Uh, in the same way, there are data spokes uh, focus on technology for, I mean, we are listening very interesting talk about computational pathology. So we are going to have six computational or digital pathology hubs and also six uh, radiology hubs, which are working with the companies uh, while investing in all of that. So we are going to have repositories of structured data, which can be used by researchers. So that's one thing. What about data repository, i.e. creating that? The second issue I think is very important, which probably has not been touched upon as much, is the ethical issues of data sharing and data capture. That is the legal implications of using algorithms uh, making decisions. And I think we, this is a huge task. So, so what is, who owns that data? Ownership, who has given consent to use that data? As you know, in UK and Europe, we use GDPR and call record. So we can't simply give even unstructured data to anybody else. So how do we actually marry up use of accessibility with use of privacy and consent and ownership. I think that's a very big area that we need to work on. Now there is a legal implication and I, many of you would have actually uh, read this trolley question which came from MIT and I think if you are interested, go and see if the trolley makes a wrong decision, how many people and what kind of people you would like to kill it as compared to people you like to save. So if we make mistakes uh, using AI, machine makes mistake or doctors make mistake, who is uh, liable for that mistake causing a complaint. I, I think so these are the questions that need to be answered. How do we uh, capture data, store data in a, in a, in a very uh, safe way? Secondly, how do we share data with uh, th uh, third parties, i.e. multinational or national companies, and uh, who is going to be liable? So, so I think there are many things happening and we have to address all of those questions for us to actually able to start. We have to create that ecosystem on which all these companies and everything works. So I think that is a huge amount of work going and I think to me that will be the basis of us doing all things that wonderful things we want to do. So that is my wider uh, topic of my, my interest in data and how it should be shared. I think in terms of surgery, as I said, when we were surgeons, because the, 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 the surgery was that we were doing open operations so we were standing beside the surgeon. And then we started developing curricula in UK in, in, in 90s, it came in uh, with Kalman that every surgical curricula would have three components. One is competency, that is attributes and the knowledge. And the knowledge of the passing exam, we said, we used to write FRC, Geology or whatever. And so that only was a test of knowledge, but not about competencies. And the SECs came in and said, oh, you must do 15 of this, 20 of this. And th what was that based on? And as I showed that there's a third, six fold variation among specialities. And again, attributes as well, that how you can be a good doctor, safe surgeon or whatever. I think going forward, as the technology moves, uh, it gives us the ability how good looks like. So we are, for the first time, able to write music. I mean, I know in Indian classical uh, music, or you can listen and you can say, this was sitar or this was that string being played. Now, in, in, if you see English or European classical music, they write music. And then other people can play back or whatever. I think we have to move from, not in any, any way, I, I am lover of uh, Indian classical music, 
to move away from somebody's ears to appreciate music, to be able to write music, and then other people can follow that. I think surgery has to move in that way as well, that we should be able to say how good looks like in surgical sense, and other people can follow and objectively can say. I think with APMs, so two things, with APMs you can, we'll be able to write music or write, write how surgery looks like. And with uh, tools, i.e. mixed reality and virtual reality, people can start training very early on to, to be able to do things at their own pace in their own time. So have the basic knowledge and then work on simulators. So before they come and work on people or assist patients in real life, they are 75, 85% trained as pilots are, as you know, other industrial uh, engineers are, they are trained and they have developed and architects are, they actually have constructed all the structures before they come in. I think all of these things will come in for future surgical training. And I also, um, uh, it was also mentioned that I think uh, surgeons previously, if you wanted to be a if you're a very bright surgeon, you'll do PhD in molecular biology and everything. I think you do PhDs in artificial intelligence as a surgeon or an engineer. So you, we should have this within our surgical training or in medical training, an understanding of uh, computational sciences. I think that will come. So I think that's where we go. We'll move from, as I say, agrarian society to mechanical industrial society to digital society and surgery will go that way. Can I just ask you one more? It was a really good insight on, on the legalities of data and so on and so forth. Uh, Prof, we, we do have a lot of data. Is it possible for us to integrate all of these data and create virtual cohorts patients? And as a result, provide individualized care? Do you think that's possible? I think this is what we are working towards that we, I, I think that uh, uh, we, we should be able to capture population data uh, of all kinds. They are omics or, or they are health data, mental health data, they are social data, and, and their primary care data, EHR data. So we should know that particular person uh, is maybe at a risk of developing sepsis more than anybody else because of genomic profile, or maybe at a risk of developing blood clots or arrhythmias. Before a patient comes in, he or she wants to have hip surgery or knee surgery or urology, whatever. So before the patient pitches up to see a primary care doctor, that data is available, what this patient actually may be at risk as. And before the patient comes for surgery, we can start prehabilitation if they have got uncontrolled diabetes or they have uncontrolled hypertension or they're obese or whatever, we can actually change so they come in at the best shape or they have frailty. We can work on frailty because as you know, in England, most of the patients come in for surgery, they are old and they have comorbidities. So we can, as you say, in regression analysis, you can uh, capture for that. You can, you, can, you can make sure that all of those are in the best way. And once we can capture surgical data, and marry up with the pre-op data, we can be able to see what this patient needs for the next 90 days or 100 days. As I was telling you that world over, 30 days mortality is the third commonest cause of death in the world. That's the third commonest cause of death. In UK, 90 days mortality is the third commonest cause of death. So we, lots of people die in UK and world over just immediately after surgery. So if we have that data, we can individualize in that old frail person that he or she will develop uh, uh, you know, arrhythmias or, or blood clots. And if you mention Internet of Things, we can put sensors on that person or mobility data to see that person moves. So I think we are ultimately going to develop the whole digital journey for a patient to start and he or she decides or needs an operation. Ultimately, that person go back to reality. That's our ultimate aim. But before we do that, we need to develop repositories. We need to uh, ensure that people are happy to share their data and ultimately there's a legal basis on which we can use and machine, uh, develop tools uh, which will be legally enforceable or actually legally sound for surgeons and, and, and also uh, technologists. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, I've got one final question for Manish. Uh, Manish, uh, what do you, you know, AI has a degree of expense. In a country like India, where you know some people are, you know, poverty is an issue. Uh, how easy is it for us to introduce artificial intelligence in a country like India? Yeah. So as I think uh, Amit and most of us have mentioned, like for AI to be a, a very workful data quality, pretty much important, and uh, and that's why uh, uh, to make available healthcare with 
powered by AI, an affordable AI becomes a bit tricky because if you want the quality data and input data, which has been uh, post into devices, or it has been given to a doctor, either robotics or either uh, robotics or IOMP uh, devices, they they need to standardize that input uh, part of process. And uh, so that is that is a path which needs to be uh, uh, traveled by AI, the part which needs to be traveled by robotics. So definitely, as as uh, uh, Mahesh, uh, uh, Mr. Mahesh, has said that uh, we can will we'll be able to travel that part, but it's always better that most of the distance is covered by AI because if most of the distance is covered by AI. The accuracy increases as told by Dr. Renu that AI gives you more standardized results. Plus, the affordability will increase because robotics is a hardware part of the grades and has a cost to it, which is a recurring cost. Correct. So, uh, so currently, it's it's actually like uh, Henry Ford uh, in in car manufacturing. Like, as long as you tell me that if you want to uh, you need a black car, I'll I'll give it to you. Uh, but if you want to customize, I'm not able to. So similarly, right now, uh, the AI is in that phase only that if you give me a very quality data, and only I'm able to process it. So there are still things coming up for image enhancing and proving that even a data which is not good enough, if it's being provided and if it's uh, it's it's providing accurate data, then uh, uh, this particular thing that we are able to produce. Uh, Healthcare uh, system which is affordable, accessible, and yet accurate will be uh, possible in the future. Uh, thank you, Manish. I think uh, there are a number of questions uh, uh, on this topic, and because people are really interested in this, uh, that's understandable. But in the interest of time, we're having to actually conclude. And I'll ask uh, Jitesh if you could give us some uh, uh, closing remarks, please. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhavan. It was a fruitful evening. The webinar today on artificial intelligence has given us a lot of information and learning. I am sure it is the same for all the participants and viewers. I thank iTrue team for making this event successful. I thank all the expert panelists for such an ins insightful talks and moderators who smoothly uh, driven this particular event. I'm thankful to Mr. Vivek and his team from Sun Pharmaceuticals for supporting the event. I'm thankful uh, for, uh, to Rahul and his team from Medisage for the technical support extended. I thank Manipal The Talk Network, IECSC Manipal, Biomedical Engineering Society of India, Manipal Chapter for their support. To thank all our viewers for attending today's program. Uh, and we'd also like to thank Sun Pharma and Medisage for helping us with today's program. Thank you very much.